dishes. An extra moment before a meeting is not a wasted time. Yeah, or taking an actual breath. And then we'll have about 40 or so minutes um, for her portion as well as questions. And then we'll go through uh, the Q&A doc that we, that the board had. Um, if there's any sort of follow-up questions with the answers that Julie and Kate have put in there, we can talk through it then. Um, and then Kate has created a document um, that just shows sort of current status as well as any, um, any of the things that were in motion, updates on those, and we'll sort of use that as a basis for how we want to um, this, any decisions that we want to make as a finance committee in terms of next steps when we go to the town council workshop. How's that for an agenda? Anything you guys want to add? Okay, money. All right, thank you. So April, not to put you on the spot, but what before Monique starts, you want to just for anybody who's watching or our our public that's here, just give some context as to why we asked Monique to join us. Uh, sure, absolutely. So after we were presented to by the full school department during our two two day workshop, um, many members of the community, myself included, um, still had some questions around the role and the services that our instructional coaches play. Um, specifically, um, people were curious how many instructional coaches we have at each phase level um, and what their day-to-day -day roles are. Um, and so if we could get some clarity into those things and then I have a few other more specific questions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I apologize for the um, throat lozenger. Got a bit of a cough, so I'm gonna work my way through this. Uh, we have a program description. There's a link here. I'll post that on the website. I don't have paper copies for you, but can run upstairs and generate some. We have a coach, instructional coaching program that developed about 2011-12. When I ran our program description through a Wordle application online, this is what came up, which um, was pretty interesting to me because learning is at the heart of it. Uh, it includes teachers and students' curriculum and coaching. Um, our instructional coach program is really about increasing the learning for students and supporting teachers along the way. <coughs> but co instructional coaching is not new. Um, it may be relatively new to Maine, although there are some districts. We belong to a coaching co-op, and there are some districts who've had instructional coaches for over 10 years. Um, nationally, there are reading coaches, about 27%, math coaches, 18%, and general instructional coaches, about a quarter of the districts across the country. As of the survey done in 2015-16 uh, um, <coughs> reports. Uh, one of the advantages of coaches is it maximizes uh, the return on investment to workshops. Um, one of the pieces that got us going and got us intrigued in the notion of instructional coaches is that this data, this research that was done in 1986, indicates what we know 
that when we send people off to conferences, they well may gather some information, they may even be presented with theory, they may even be provided a demonstration, they may even get to practice that at the workshop a little bit, but when they come back, if they don't get feedback, and you'll see knowledge information, skill, and transfer of the actual training, it has a very little effect. When you add coaching, sustained instructional coaching to that, it lifts the effect size to up over 1.68 in terms of the transfer of uh, learning on the part of teachers. So here in Scarborough, we wanted to make sure that our coaching program had focus and was lined up to our vision for continuous improvement. So they really focus on two aspects of the four themes, the one around effective teaching and learning and safe and inclusive schools. That's their focus. We have in the district a process by which when we set our own goals for improvement for ourselves, we ask the essential question, what do my students, as classroom teachers, what do my students need me to get better at? And so as a leader, what do my leaders need to get better at? So we also established some givens around this thing um, called coaching. The expectation in the given is that all teachers strive to improve their practice. We know that. Good teachers are good learners. Teachers are also the most important factor at improving student learning. Also, providing teachers at the point closest to the interaction with their student is the leverage point for increasing that student achievement. And what instructional coaches actually do is they help teachers be successful in improving their practice. And they do that in lots of different ways. So our instructional coaches are really, their focus is twofold. One is the curriculum coordination. The second is really around promoting instructional quality. And that is all around improving the learning for students. So they ser serve as, they don't go in the classroom and tell teachers what to do. We know that is not good practice. They serve as thinking partners. They work in collaboration with teachers. So much of their work is building relationships with teachers so that there's a trusting relationship there and they work together. So there's a lot of choice and there's a lot of meeting teachers where they're at. There's also the curriculum coordination. They also work at professional development programming and they also serve the function to pinch hit. And I'll give you some examples of how they have pitch, been pitch hitting in the building. Who they are this year, um, and this has shifted over time. At K2, there are three and they generally cover the areas of literacy, mathematics, and technology, but they also support other initiatives at the K2 phase level. And they all work together across content areas. For example, at K2, they've been working together at doing some integrative units that address science and social studies and STEM as well. 3-5, we have three instructional coaches quite similar to K2. 6-8, we moved to a humanities sciences format. So they, those, we had those three coaches Two of the coaches cover all the humanities and all the sciences. So Kara works with the science teachers, also works with the um, math teachers as well as the STEM teachers. At 9-12, given the schedules and the resources available, we have two instructional coaches. Michelle Shook came to us. She's part-time Latin and she's also part-time instructional coach. Uh, Jen Adams is a technology instructional coach and she's full-time coaching. <laughs> One of the things that we started this year after some training um, was what are called student-centered coaching cycles. And this is a way to focus the work on the students. So what a student-centered coaching cycle is, the teacher and the instructional coach meet together, they identify the goals for students. Teachers generally know what their goals are for their students. They might work on developing some pre-assessments. It all depends on what the teacher needs. Um, they work on the pre-assessments and then they begin to design the instructional units or adjust the instructional units or try out the instructional units. Th and they then go into a phase where, and we talk about light coaching cycles or heavy coaching cycles, sometimes it's just a consult. Other times it's more heavy where the teacher and the coach co-plan the lesson or the coach is modeling the lesson in the classroom or supporting the teacher with different groups of students in the classroom. It all depends on the needs of the teachers. Then the next stage is they do have a post meeting where they talk about how that lesson went. And it's not a situation where the coach is telling the teacher what went well and what didn't go well. It's that thinking partner, partner routine where they're side by side. What did you think about the lesson? How did you see the lesson going? What do you notice about the students? Let's look at the student data. 
So the focus is all around the students and their learning, and then the conversation shifts to, okay, what next for these students? Which students do you think really got it? Which students didn't get it? How do we adjust for that? I've got some ideas. Would you like some ideas? Yeah, let's try some ideas. Could you put some things together for me? Yes, I can put some things together for you and bring them to the next class. So that's just a little example of what that coaching cycle looks like. But there are roles for coaches. We were, um, the National Staff Development Council has a coaches academy and they support development of instructional coaches. So we've used their resources. So there's certainly a classroom supporter where they model effective instructional strategies and they co-plan and they co-teach. But they're also a data coach because they're focused on the data around the students. Are the students learning? To what extent? If a student doesn't get it, what do, they go to? What do we do next? There are also resource providers. One of the best ways to develop a trusting relationship with teachers is asking them for what they need and then finding the resources to get it. It can be stuff. It can be organizing materials for the teachers. It can also be access to websites and lesson plans and assessments and resources. They're also a curriculum specialist. Does it mean that they're content experts? It means that they help facilitate the curriculum process. And we have an online curriculum guide that they're working with classroom teachers at developing units and refining those units so they can be shared across the district. And lastly, another big role is to be mentors to new teachers. We have new teachers who are brand new to the profession as well as the district, and we have teachers who are new to the districts. They support those teachers in learning our curriculum, our instructional methodologies that are effective, getting them the resources they need, helping them in supporting the classroom and getting used to the new school, along with other supports that teachers have as they're new. There are also that instructional specialist. They know what adult learning looks like and how it can be effective for teachers so that we do not have to send teachers out to workshops. So what have they been doing this year? Um, they do a lot. And so coming to some um, descriptions around that uh, was challenging as we work together. At K2, and every phase level is in a different place depending on what's going on with the building and what their goals are. At K2, they've been involved, there are those three staff persons have been involved in over 40 heavy coaching cycles in which they have an ongoing relationship with classroom teachers at the K2 and are working within classrooms. But then more than 40 light coaching cycles where it may be just a consult, it may be just um, a conversation. There are also learning facilitators. They plan the curriculum meetings that happen after school, those 90 minute curriculum meetings. They're also involved in leveraging STEM education, Talk Moves is an instructional strategy. They also provide literacy workshops for the teachers and they coordinated the Bar Harm professional learning. They're also resource providers. They support teachers with all those materials, assessments, activities on an on request basis. When I first asked them that I wanted to track some of this data around their interactions, they were um, dumbfounded because they might have 70, 80 interactions, whether it's email, personal conversations during the day on the fly with the teachers as they're going about their work in the building. They're also involved in RTI intervention planning. So they may meet in, an, uh, in a response to intervention where they're problem solving what works for a child. They might have some ideas for either the student or the academic support might, teacher might have some ideas for student uh, and then they might help support the classroom teacher in providing that service to the student. In the area of instruction and support, they assist in larger classrooms. They might pull some kids aside to do some, some little groups. They might do some um, flexible group enrichment. Um, they've all, also covered classrooms in a pinch um, when substitutes couldn't be found, and they've also covered duties occasionally. At 3-5 at the Wentworth School this past year was a little bit of an anomaly. Um, they've been involved in more than 75 light coaching sessions because um, the instructional coaches were needed to help support a classroom in which we had a long-term sub situation. We were unable to find a sufficient long-term sub, so two of the three instructional coaches were actually providing instruction to students in the classroom. Uh, <clears throat> other pieces at 3-5, they also do the curriculum meetings. Um, they assist in training for Google. They've been running literacy workshops. Uh, the district, they also help coordinate the district testing um, that takes place and also in interpreting the data with the teachers. Uh, they're also involved in intervention planning and new teacher support. The other piece that happens at Wentworth is that what they found is when we have students transferring into the district, 
they don't understand the language of our curriculum, and in some cases they're not up to speed with our curriculum. They don't necessarily need an academic intervention, per se, but they do need some lessons to help scaffold them so that they can understand what's going on in the classrooms. So the instructional coaches will provide that temporary service as well. Uh, at the middle school, the three instructional coaches um, have been involved in the coaching cycles as well. They're doing seven heavy and 11 light to medium. Um, but they also have, because the teachers at the middle school have team time, they're also involved in what, are called, what the middle school calls content meetings, which is really working on the curriculum units, planning those lessons, activities, having those discussions. And at the middle school, they're working on helping the teams facilitate themselves to accomplish the work and providing them with um, ways in which they can have those conversations so it isn't always dependent on an instructional coach. They also are a resource providing provider in terms of district testing coordination. One of those coaches, the technology coach, is also a part-time social studies teacher there, but they've also assisted with state testing coordination, which is kind of an all-hands-on-deck situation when we're involved there. They've also done some small group instruction um, for writing. And lastly, at the high school, the two instructional coaches, one was on maternity leave from September through December, uh, and the other instructional coach um, is a part-time Latin teacher, is uh, four-tenths Latin. But they've been heavily involved in the student center coaching, and they use the, um, our teacher growth and evaluation model has, um, and teachers need to do this, what's called a student learning objective, where the teachers need to provide um, sort of pre-assessment data on their students. They instruct, they provide their instruction, and then they do some probes. This is a new practice for teachers at the high school, but it fit very well with the student-centered coaching cycle because that's essentially what it does, how our coaches can support teachers mm -hmm. there. So they took part, um, the teachers at the high school really stepped up and accessed the coaches for that support. Uh, <coughs> this is just some feedback from teachers from exit slips. Um, the coaches are very good about, about providing exit slips with everything that they do because they use those exit slips and they use the feedback that they get to then plan future meetings and, and uh, particularly curriculum meetings, content meetings, even teacher design meetings. They're also involved in PLT meetings on late start Wednesday, Wednesdays. So there was a notion that our professional development funding over time decreased when we started with the coaching. In fact, it actually increased and only in the past two years has it decreased. And this funding I took from allocated professional development time allocated professional development lines at the schools and curriculum. There are other professional development lines as well in the budget. Um, so in terms of a cost comparison, when we look at our regional consultants, um, they range anywhere from, on a per day basis, from about $1,100 to $2,400 per day if we want someone to come in for the day. Um, so that puts them at about $150 to $300. Uh, per hour. When I did took a look, Kate gave me the information about salaries and benefits for our coaches, and I looked at it by phase level. It ranged from $51 to $66 per hour. So in terms of delivering that professional development and developing those relationships with those teachers to improve instruction, um, it's a great savings to have the instructional coaches on board. The other qualitative value added, and I don't know how to quantify that, is when they're being asked to pinch hit, they know the curriculum, they know the teachers, they're familiar with the students, and they know those school routines. So a principal can use those folks to help out in situations where we would not have to hire a full day sub for a part-time activity. Um, but also, um, it minimizes our <coughs> need to hire outside consultants or send teachers off to workshops all the time. We will generally try and send either a teacher and or a coach to come back and co-plan and then deliver teachers. And then we're currently, um, I'm trying to keep up with the um, research, current research on coaching um, as it is spreading. There are probably about 30 to 40 districts across, across the state that also have instructional coaches, so we're not new or unique. Um, <clears throat> but one of the pieces, which we've certainly found true, is to have a purpose and a goal for coaches. And every fall, we bring the program description to the principals at the Leadership Council, and we have a conversation. What are the priorities this year? What are the goals? How can the coaches help out? And we tweak that program description 
um, as a result. And the student-centered coaching piece and having coaches be more involved in the classrooms was certainly a piece. So we pulled a research-based model and are working on implementing that this year. This is just a little graphic about instructional coaching across the country, just a general description overall. And that's it. Wait, there's two minutes. Thank you. So I'm happy to entertain questions on this. I know I just gave you a lot of information. I'll start. Um, thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, do you? In, you might have touched upon this at the very end there, but do you have any? Um, I guess how do you measure and quantify success? with the program? Like, do you do any surveys with the teacher? Do you look at, do correlations with students, um, you know, grades and, and progress? Yeah, that's one of the pieces that we are building along the way because there are so many variables. I don't want to only use the state assessments yeah. and their role. Um, it's hard to quantify whether or not that's a direct result of the instructional coaches. One of the pieces that they do, that they look at those pieces is um, is via the exit slips in terms of the teacher's feedback from the activities that are going on. Um, and also, a, um, uh, they're also working on putting together something more comprehensive. Uh, the other piece is within the student-centered coaching model, there is a document that the, te that the coaches use with the teachers where we have our pre-assessment data and our post-assessment data. We're just working on that now, and one of the things that we do <coughs> We're, we plan to do, because this is a new model, is to um, compile that information so that we can summarize that information. But because we're just starting out and some of the coaches were teaching, mm -hmm. um, we haven't coordinated that effort yet. We do have a program goal around uh, <coughs> student-centered coaching where there'll be a certain percentage numbers of coaching that takes place at each building with an improvement in student learning. So we do want to look at that outcome um, in this year, we just wanted it connected, so we're going to get some baseline information after this first year and be happy to report back on that from those coaching cycles. Okay. And just, I guess, more anecdotally for the exit slip, so there's only, I'm sure you have a lot of them, so thank you for not putting yeah. them all in here. Um, <laughs> but just generally, do those trend more to positive or constructive? Yeah. I, I, Generally, the feedback is positive. We also look for feedback on what our next steps or adjustments coaches can make. So it's a moving picture in terms of what's provided. Um, <clears throat> the other part of the instructional coaching picture that's important to understand is that sometimes instructional coaches um, are portrayed as change agents. And so sometimes there is pushback on coaching and coaches because that I call it organizational resistance to change. Uh, and that's why we've been very, very careful that our instructional coaches are not involved in the teacher evaluation process. They're not evaluative in any way. And we focus on building trusting relationships with teachers because we want to establish a community of learners and support for teachers, not assessing or evaluating those. And that's why we focus, we're gonna be focusing on the student performance as a result of the coaching. So that is sometimes we will get pushback on some things that the coaches are doing, and that's where the principals play an important role. Um, they help roll out whatever the initiative or the coaching activities are for the coming year because it's a, this is where we're going. Um, generally, it's based on feedback. For example, at the K-5, the writing, it's the writing goal. So a lot of the energy and the efforts this year, particularly at K-5, is in and around the writing. So Anne-Marie and Courtney and Peggy have been working with the classroom teachers around that, um, the writing, the assessments, uh, also calibrating with the teachers, having the teachers have conversations. Okay, if the score is here, where do we go next? Those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> is participation voluntary? It depends. Um, the curriculum meetings are required in the afternoon. What we try and do is try to build something that works for everyone, and that's why that feedback to design, lots of times they'll design little mini workshops or have teachers sharing their strategies. Um, so those are not, but when we offer, the coaches will offer summer workshops based on the interest of teachers, and those are voluntary. 
What about the more individualized assistance? Right now we're looking at it as a, um, an attraction um, piece model piece. Um, if a principal has, might have concerns about a teacher or sees a potential growth opportunity for a teacher who isn't necessarily reaching out to the coaches, they might suggest that they do. Um, but we're looking at it as a, an asset-based model um, where we want to build on people's strengths. Do you have any idea of the number of teachers that um, the coaches have individually assisted in at school? Like at well, they level? have connected with um, either via their communicate, they also have communication and resources they put out. They have coaches corners. Um, they include information in weekly updates and things. So it depends on what kind of interaction or what level of interaction they've had. Um, we have some teachers who would love to use them all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have some teachers who are pretty independent and are, nope, I'm fine, kind of thing, but they're always checking in with, they try and check in, their goal is to check in with every single teacher and build a relationship with every single teacher. So the degree of interaction would vary. Who um, is the supervisor of the instructional coaches? I co-supervise the instructional coaches with the building principals. Every month I meet with the instructional coaches and the building principals, <coughs> excuse me, to talk about what's been happening, what um, the successes are, what the challenges are, and what the planning is moving forward. Um, so they set, the coaches set an outcome they, for themselves, which is aligned to the building goals for the work at the building, but they also set a leadership outcome for themselves so they're building their coaching skills. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Monique, are each of the instructional coaches also certified to teach? Mm -hmm. um, have you found <laughs> So I think that there's a little bit of a, a, an odd dynamic happening, and I'm just going to put this out there, and it might just be me. Um, <coughs> we've actually, as a board, gotten um, some negative feedback about the instructional coaches. And so yep. I think partially what we're trying to do is reconcile some of the negative feedback that we get um, to better understand their role and sure. maybe where some of that negative yep. feedback would be coming from. Um, and so do you find that different models work better at different phase levels. For example, I know it's difficult to imagine a hybrid situation where an instructional coach would also be a teacher at a lower phase level because those teachers are with their same group of kids all day long as opposed to a high school where there's a little bit more flexibility yeah. in their day. Yeah. Um, yeah. The longer an instructional coach is out of the classroom, the more at risk they are of see, being, being seen as less credible. <coughs> Excuse me, because they're not speaking from experience or recent yeah. experience. Um, but a lot of the coaching pieces isn't about telling the teacher about their own practice. It's really learning how to coach someone side by side. So yes, there could be some fight and there could be some places where we might make some improvement. <coughs> Excuse me, K-5 is a challenge because of that schedule. And we've often thought about what we could do around that, but we haven't come up with anything yet. <coughs> to April, a, a common, not just specific in Scarborough, but generally with the coaching role, a common challenge is that often they're perceived as like an extension of administration when in fact they're not. Um, and we work really, really hard to ensure that that's, like Monique talked about, that they don't evaluate, they don't report what Alicia needs to work on and <coughs> practice to the principal or to Monique. It's more generally about um, the structure uh, in, of support but I think that for some teachers, they still they, they see instructional coaches as an extension of administration, and that can be challenging both for the coaches and for the teachers who um, we're trying to coach into. I'll do that. Okay. I promise. I just need to scratch my coat. There's a little bit of coughing. Okay. <laughs> Julie, you may be able to answer this. So the sure. so Monique said that the instructional coaches don't participate in the teacher evaluations, but is that? reverse, so do the teachers participate in the instructional coaches evaluation? No, so the instructional coaches are treated like a teacher. They are teachers, they're certified teachers. Um, so they get evaluated by their principal and Monique, but they don't evaluate other teachers. But and so te teachers don't evaluate formally in the evaluation system um, instructional coaches because they're colleagues, they're peers. They're actually peers in our organizational structure. 
but they do give feedback in a variety of ways through um, exit slips and um, I think there's certain times in the year where we might do like a survey generally about the quality of coaching or what they need from coaches um, or in the context of, of at the end of a curriculum meeting, how effective was this um, session or whatever. Does that make sense? Yes. I understand that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no, um, that would be like the equivalent of one principal evaluating another principal. And so we don't, teachers don't evaluate each other partly because they're in their classrooms teaching. They don't see each other teach as often. Um, but one of our goals is to create more of a feedback cycle where even a classroom teacher is getting into another classroom teacher's um, room to see instruction, effective instruction, hap instruction happening, but not in an evaluative way. Okay. I have two questions. Um, my understanding with elite teachers is that they also do mentoring. How does that work if there are two mentors with a teacher, which is considered the, the primary person that would work with somebody who is new? Um, I don't, so coaching is different than mentoring. Um, so coaching is specific to the practice, where mentoring is more like specific to you as a person. Like, are you having work-life balance? You know, do you know where your lunch goes? Like some of those kind of basic things for new staff. Um, could a person have, could a person, could a teacher be being coached by an instructional coach and have a mentor at the same time? Yes, but they have really different roles and responsibilities. Okay. And so the lead teachers, I don't know that they're formal. Um, I, think, I think our goal is that everybody's a mentor to everybody at some point, but I don't know that that's a core responsibility for lead teachers. Okay. I'm going to hop over here and grab a mic. Okay. My other question. Can I just throw one more thought in there? Because I know that one of the labels in our budget is lead teachers, mentors, something, stipends. Um, there are actually a group of teachers who we label as certification mentors, mm -hmm. and their job is very specific, which is to help teachers who are on the certification cycle complete their paperwork, make sure that, that they have their plan in place, and there's one of those at each phase. Um, and then there's a central district group and they meet together. So when it says mentors in the budget description, that's actually the mentors that we're talking about. Certification. Okay. Certification mentors. Mm -hmm. And they're a piece of that budget line because they have a specific little stipend for that. Great. So Thank I just you. thought. Sorry. Oh, so now I, I pick up what you're, what you're asking now. Yeah, two different jobs. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That wasn't clear in the way that the presentation had come through. Well, and, and I realized that in the budget line, it was confusing the issue because there were several different roles embedded in that one stipend line or that group of stipend line. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is at like the middle school or the high school level where they get more concentrated in specific classes. Um, how does that work for a coach to go in if their core is humanities into the sciences to do a classroom teaching? How? Yeah, um, a coach helps a teacher think about their practice. They don't need to have the content knowledge background. Certainly our coaches feel more comfortable if they do. Um, <clears throat> and so for example, Michelle Shipp was working with teachers on these SLOs. And so she had, one of the pieces around this process is identifying your pre-assessment and then some formative assessment strategies. So she found an, um, a resource which had over 60 different ideas for formative assessment activities that teachers could use irregardless of the content area. Mm -hmm. So she was sharing tools that cross all content areas. If teachers have um, specific questions about their content area and the instructional methodology in the content area, particularly at middle school and high school, they would rely on their team for that, the other content area experts. Mm -hmm. And that kind of spurred another question. Um, so when the teachers have their meetings, like department meetings, are the coaches part of that to be included in the best practices and methodologies, or is it separate from what happens in their, in their departments? Well, what will happen <laughs> within the department meetings is a department head might ask a coach to come and have a conversation depending on the topic that's going on, or if the coach 
for example, Michelle wanted to offer this SLO piece with some examples, and so she worked with a few individual teachers, but then she asked the department heads if she could come and share at a department meeting. Um, so she gets on their agendas that way. In middle school in the content areas, it was a school-wide expectation that they were gonna have these meetings and these were the tasks that were going to happen. That gets established, I think it's the leadership level at the middle mm -hmm. school, and then the coaches are there in a supporting role. Okay, thank you, you're welcome. It gets a little tricky, because we have, there's, I, I, I don't wanna talk individually about any of our instructional coaches, because I'm sure that as professionals, they are all um, fantastic. They are. We have, we have two at the high school, one of whom is doing like a hybrid where she's in it, she's teaching and then she's also doing the coaching. <clears throat> the other uh, instructional coach you have listed under technology. Mm -hmm. Don't we have a deficit in our math technology program, science technology program up at the high school where she could be doing something similar, teaching teaching at least a couple of sections of class and coaching? So she is actually gonna teach a section next year. She's gonna teach the adulting course, but it's about, at the high school, it's certification driven. So what we're asking for, I think, is what I, if I'm hearing you correctly, in terms of the new STEM teacher, is actually to bring on board specifically someone with an engineering background, because that's a gap that we have currently um, and there's some new survey courses that folks, um, that the high school wants to offer based on student needs and industry um, expectations and things like that. And we wouldn't currently have enough staff in order to do that. The, and correct me if I'm wrong, Monique, but the technology coaches really play a critical role in making sure that this doesn't become a fancy pencil and that we're actually integrating technology in a really high quality way so that we work differently um, and more efficiently and effectively and not just you know replacing paper and pencil with um, the technology. Yes, and she is also working on expanding the makerspace notion in the, um, in the learning commons. Mm -hmm. She also carries an advisee group as well um, in the high school. She also works at helping high school students um, navigate shifting all of their um, Google files and folders over as they transition out of high school. She helps out with the freshman students as well. Um, so while it's not a class, she has interactions and she supports that work so that doesn't have to come out of class time. I think we would all argue that the high school does not have enough coaching support. Yeah. Well, and Monique, wouldn't you agree that in, in the beginning of the development of instructional coaches, there was a lot of time spent talking about the high school because we already have department heads who are presumably content area experts, and there was there was some felt that there was some overlap there. I wouldn't argue that we have all the resources we need there because there are many different that those leads play, mm -hmm. department heads play, but it was part of the conversation initially, which is yeah. why you see it more front-loaded at the lower grades. Yeah. Yes, we had lots of conversation about how could we leverage the lead teachers at the buildings or use their time that they have, um, where we landed on this model, and this model has grown and shifted over time, is that with the lead teachers, there just wasn't enough time in the day, and then at, certainly at the K-5, we had that sort of how do you do a part-time kind of a situation because they're not compartmentalized in classes. Um, and that's where we landed on this. Um, the principals were not willing to give up their lead teacher times because of the um, roles that the lead teachers play in just helping manage the buildings moving forward. And so now, in some respects, we, they also have instructional coaches helping out with some of those pieces as well. <clears throat> and also at the high school level, the department heads, we've really been talking and working to try to shift the role of the department head to be more that of a content specific coach, and they receive less <coughs> time, so they teach one less section than their colleagues in the department um, as part of that role, plus receive a stipend, where at the other phase levels, there isn't that type of flexibility um, to be able to release, even the lead teachers don't have release time right. at the K-5 
maintain grade level. So it becomes hard to support any lead teacher with some, you know, the skills, knowledge, strategies that they might need as leaders, um, even in working with their colleagues, finding the time to develop teachers who are interested in more leadership, take on more leadership roles. That, that's an ongoing challenge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Monique. While Monique's here, do you have any curriculum and instruction related budget questions that you'd like clarification on or uh, specific line items before we let her go? Wrap there, up? Were, there were a whole lot of um, uh, software <coughs> um, I don't know if you yep. systems or what, but soft, there was a lot of software identified as part of the um, online and contracted services, and I don't want to eat up a lot of time, but I didn't know what a lot of them were. Can you just sort of outline? Sure. Some of, of those are um, what I might refer to as productivity pieces. Uh, so, for example, the software that um, is called Enriching Students, used at the high school and the middle school, I can typically negotiate a better cost if I do a cross phase level. Typically, most of mine are instructional, but that one, for example, is a productivity piece of software um, that rests within um, my budget. And what that is used for is for students to schedule or tag help and extra help with their teachers um, <clears throat> in the schools. Um, other software, for example, with the overhead projectors um, comes software that comes with the overhead projector. Um, we call it Smart Notebook. So there are lesson plans embedded in those pieces. Um, that's another piece, an example of software. Uh, another piece of software we have is called Google, uh, Google Reading Write, which is um, it's an extension, but we pay for that, which allows students, it's a reader, it's an online reader, and it um, allows text help. It also translates text. So we make that available to all students. Um, <coughs> more instructional pieces of software, um, we have, we need a solution for uh, video editing. Um, so we have um, video editing software there. We have um, Pear Deck, which is our formative feedback piece that gets embedded into instructional PowerPoints. We have um, a couple of subscriptions in that line. Um, one new request is a piece of software called Seesaw, which will allow the K2 parents to be able to see their students' works. Uh, if April is nodding, because I, probably a teacher uses mm -hmm. that, it's a great way to communicate. We've been doing the free version. We want to be able to expand that opportunity so that all teachers can, at the K2 level, can um, better communicate um, the work that students are doing at school and home. Those are just some little examples. That is our district-wide assessment. I didn't put a particular vendor name in there because we're still in the process of deciding on a new vendor. Okay. So, so it's referred to as, that cost is significant. Um, we also have, we also, out of that line, we also fund the PSATs for our sophomores um, and juniors, and that comes out of that line as well. That's that college board piece. Do you want to mention about the universal screener and the fact that we're transitioning? <coughs> From we, one part to we, another, yeah, we have been using um, a product our vendor is Renaissance. It's called the STAR testing. Um, we're going to be transitioning to either the NWEA or the iReady, and I'm in the process of getting price quotes. It's going to fit within that ballpark. We just won't contract for anything additional. And are there costs associated with that migration? No. Due to time. Well, due to just time. I mean, Phil Kellick and um, our information specialist will be doing all the rostering okay. on that. We won't be importing any old data. The data that we um, have has been imported into our data analytics software already. So okay. we'll just start fresh. Sorry, just a, a clarification. So the universal screener, I look the like 29,000. Yep. You said the PSAT is just a part of that? Does that make so, it? No, no, it's a part of that um, cost center. Sorry, okay, it's separate. Yeah. Okay. It's separate. <clears throat> What's the improvement strategist position? The improvement strategist position is um, a position that um, really helps us with utilizing, analyzing, and making good decisions on our data. 
so she has been working on that data wise process in making sure that everyone is following that so that we're making good decisions with the data we have she's also been working with me and with the information specialist at our data management map in terms of what data is available what sources it can be found in how we can access that how we can streamline those piece of things so she works she provides workshops for teachers on the process she also is involved with the needs assessments the comprehensive needs assessment that we've been doing she's been running coordinating those meetings she works with me on the ESSA grant as a result of that so she's been very helpful in doing those things that I just was not able to do another title you could use for her role as data specialist or she also is our attendance officer and dropout prevention coordinator so she really has she also coaches the principals in building this continuous improvement process across the district which is our district goal number one we've been collecting a ton of data for a number of years and I say it goes into like the black hole of data so we have more data than we know what to do with and she's really playing a critical role in extracting that data creating data overviews so that it's usable for principals and teachers to really make sure that we're making evidence-based decisions but if you have questions you know where to find me thank you thank you okay any other follow-up questions on the previous board questions or just the budget in general I have one for you just related to the ed tech question mm -hmm. um, the proportionality of the benefits and the wages sure. um, and I think your response was because we've adjusted where the ed techs are based on the need mm -hmm. is that but is it, are the benefits still high because they are taking more benefits is that like what's the reason behind that yeah, so th the benefits are really specific to the person. And so Kate and I can do the exact same job. She might be in one building, I might be in another. Next year we might switch positions. Kate maybe take full benefits, I take no benefits. That's gonna cause some disproportionality. Plus where folks are in terms of their, their pay scale will play a role in that too. I think, uh, you gotta turn around. I think one of the other things that, that Julie and I talked about as we were looking through the items, the budget uh, line items to sort of see what people were thinking about, what people were looking at is um, in some cases, the way that our general ledger system is built, we've got like 600 different expenditure accounts. Some of those accounts might have one person in them or two people in them. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're looking at percent changes, um, the dollar amount may be not all that significant, but it might be like a hundred percent increase in their in right. their line, and and that can be just as simple as I was looking at one line at the middle school. We had a, a gentleman who was a building ed tech at the middle school last year who didn't take benefits and was at the bottom of the scale. He resigned. We hired a new person. That new person was a little bit higher on the wage scale and had family benefits. So it's, it's a question of proportionality, as you said, to, to um, the size of the line to begin with. And you don't see those kind of shifts so, shifts so much in the teacher lines, because in most teacher lines, you've got at least 20 right. people. Right. Um, and in most of the ed tech lines, many of the ed tech lines, you may have two, three, one person. Right. Um, support staff in general has that problem. The other thing to know is that we base these, this budget proposal is based on current staff. And so then if, if something changes, if we know that an ed tech's not returning next year, you'll see adjustments by second reading in some of these lines based on that. Right, and, and I, it kind of goes to the, the great big cycle of, 
of Life, what's the song? <laughs> Circle of Life, that, that we operate with as a finance committee because you know at the end of the fiscal year, I'm gonna be coming to you and saying, hey, we need to do a budget transfer to cover this. Um, and so many times it's a benefit line because of those, you know, you could have a $10,000 shift in a benefit line very easily just by someone leaving and a new person coming on board. I don't bring it to you if it goes the other way. <laughs> Were there other um, things on our chart here that you want to? I'm good on that, thank you. Cool. Got a name or two? Nope. Uh, okay. Before we dive into, I guess, do you want to just let us know what we're looking at here and sort of explain? <coughs> yeah, does everybody have one of these? Yeah. So, um, how to copy this? So what I've done here is, uh, this is a tool that we invented a year or two ago um, to kind of help us track the progress that we make between first and second reading. Um, and Julie likes the one that I had from two years ago because it goes on to like 11 by 17 paper and it's really exciting and has a lot of, of uh, movement on it. Last year's was a little less exciting because it was the same numbers and it fit on a shorter piece of paper. Um, so what you have at the top is uh, what our budget proposal looks like at first reading. And it's a little complicated because I wanted to outline the different funds because general fund, adult education, school nutrition, and the capital budget all have some kind of impact on the tax request that the school is making to the town. Um, so at the top grid, you've got um, sort of a complex little chart that says, here are all the different pieces of the school budget, what it looked like uh, approved in FY19, what we're asking for in FY20, and the change. And then the second chunk on that chart is your non-tax revenues for each one of those individual funds. So the last line then is your education net budget. And because the conversation that we've been having in the last couple of weeks is about what's the impact on the tax increase. Um, I'm, I figure the net budget is kind of the thing that we care most about right now. Um, and so I've set it up this way. And then the, the middle section of this that's in blue with yellow and green and all these cheery colors, um, there are two parts to that. The first piece is leadership council updates on items in motion. And you remember, you hear us saying ad nauseum that there are things that we don't know when we come out at first reading and that there are going to be changes that will take place between the first reading and the second reading that aren't really decision points. They're stuff that happens to us and we react to it and we make adjustments. Um, so the numbers that I've filled in are numbers that we actually know now. Mm -hmm. um, the changes that I've heard of or learned of um, that are gonna impact our bottom line. The yellow blocks are things that I, I still don't know for sure but I think they might move. Um, and we don't have put strong numbers to put in there, but they're things that we're still discussing as a leadership team. Then the second block I've labeled as school board finance committee discussion slash decision points. And this is an area that I think we'll be expanding on in this conversation and then also going forward where um, you folks are coming up and saying, you know, I'd really like to talk about, for example, unified basketball. We need to get that into the budget. How is that gonna look? How are we gonna make that happen? Um, there are a couple of other things that I plugged in there as sort of placeholders, but that I, uh, that's really just our, our working space going forward for what this group wants. Kate, why does that say 626 after Unified Basketball? Because that is the net increase to the budget, and I have a piece of paper about that which I'll hand out. Okay. Um, Minus the grant? No, that's... It's 7126 minus 4,000 minus the grant. Okay, What's the 4,000? 4,000 is the money that was budgeted for professional development in athletics and activities, which they're going to defer and move that over and use that as funding for the Unified Basketball. It all makes sense now. I have a, a little worksheet on that. Um, well, and now then, we just foiled your worksheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gave away the ending. The worksheet, you now know the punchline to the joke, right? Um, the, the last blue section is the capital budget, which is something that Julie might help us sort of talk through a little bit. And then the bottom line is your adjusted budget proposal, and I kind of squidged that up a little bit so you're just seeing um, the gross and then the non-tax revenues and the net. So 
total gross. So this is, I hope, a useful tool for us. Uh, my thought was that as we speak and as we talk about what the, the will of the board and the finance committee might be, then I can take some notes and say, well, that if we do that, then we will land here um, and you know, just try and capture those thoughts as we go along. See, this includes all the investments, right? Yep. It includes above all the, the investments above the red line um, in this first block. This is what was presented at uh, first reading. Kate, before we jump into specific discussion, could you explain the change, the increase between school capital non-tax revenues at first reading and school capital non-tax revenues as listed on page two? Yep, if you look at page two at the top, um, and this is obviously, none of this is decided specifically, um, unless it's things that I've put that you know, are at the top of the page that are things that we should just go ahead and do. Um, but one of the proposals that Tom Hall and Julie came up with after um, the first reading was a conversation that included a lot of talk about capital projects and the difference in the school capital non-tax revenues is $45,000, which um, the town manager has proposed to bond $45,000 instead of asking for tax dollars for that. So that was a terrible sentence. Um, in the original proposal, in the school capital budget, we had a $45,000 vehicle and it was slated to be appropriated funds. Mm -hmm. And so now the proposal has changed and those funds are expected to be financed or that vehicle is expected to be financed, which means that it doesn't have a direct impact on the bottom line tax. So that's why that yellow um, school capital non-tax revenues has changed. And if you look at the difference between that and the first reading, No, the revenues are higher because you're getting bond, uh, you're getting bond revenues. Yeah, and that's the only item on here that's actually a revenue yeah. shift because it's a difference in how you're financing, how you're funding right. um, the expenditure. Everything else that we're looking at right here is a discussion about reducing expenditures. So format-wise, does this make sense? I mean, it, it's obviously, yeah. it's, it's just a yeah. tool. It's something that we can use to sort of track our progress and, and figure out what it is that we're, we're trying, to, trying to achieve. Um, I do have, since we got onto the subject of our friend Unified Basketball, I do have a little document that I made here. And I have extras of these gentlemen if you want to grab hold of anything. Um, pass this down. What I've done on this chart is just to simplify um, a number of conversations, a number of, you know, different meetings and, um, you know, a whole <coughs> new process of, of grant application and all kinds of good things into one chart, which basically says, what was the original proposal for unified basketball? That's the first column, traditional sports program cost estimate, and then where are we now? What do, what do we think we can, how much money do we think it will take us to effectively put on this program? So the context of this piece is that traditional sports program cost estimate of $17,800, um, there's been a lot of folks saying, well, we, it doesn't really need to cost that much money. Why would you put that amount in your budget? And the short answer to that is that we costed that out, uh, Mike and I, as, as we would cost out any um, sports program that we're offering, MPA sanctioned varsity level high school sports program, which means um, using the stipend rubric that's in the teacher contract to develop the stipends, which you can see from column one to column two is quite a difference. Um, and then some of the other costs that we would expect to have to field an entirely new program high school sports level. Uh, the second column is after much conversation, deliberation, can we do things differently with this particular club or sport because it's a different model, because it's not the same as a, as a regular, um, it is still considered MPA sanctioned, but it's a, diff a very different model from a traditional varsity sport. So step one was to come up with a lower price tag 
And step two was to talk about where's the money going to come from. And so at the bottom of the page, you'll see the reallocating funds budget for FY20 PD. Uh, the $4,000 was in Mike's budget to kickstart his um, coaching National accreditation. Certification. certification, thank you. And so we, we've said, well, we'll defer that and we'll move the money into the unified basketball uh, expenses. And then the grant funds, I don't know where you folks are on um, what you've heard about that process, but Mike did make an application to Special Olympics and he's been, what's the phrase, 99% sure that, uh, that they are going to give us a grant next year and that it would be uh, in the amount of $2,500. So the 626 that you see uh, on my little fancy color chart is the net cost, the amount that we would need to increase our operating budget um, in order to make this happen. Thoughts about that? No questions That's for me. Fantastic. Thank yeah. You. <coughs> Okay, so wh why don't we continue on athletics since we're in that, comp that arena? And Kate, can you talk a little bit about the famous scoreboard request? I will gladly talk about the famous scoreboard request. Does everybody have a, a capital budget in your book? Um, this is the same thing that we handed out a few million times. So I think what, what, uh, what sent a few folks off the rails Wait, Another one? I've got, I've got old power. That's it. I'll take another one. I'm, I'm, I think what, what uh, caused a bit of consternation is actually 100% my fault because the words that I put into our capital improvement budget um, led people to believe that the reason that we wanted to do this project was because of shot clocks that were required by the MPA, which in fact is not the case. Um, we know that the MPA has been considering using shot clocks, but that they have decided that that's not gonna be a requirement for public schools in Maine because of the expenditure. So I wanna take three steps back and talk about the process by which this capital budget was built. Um, what happens is that Todd and I going through the facility section of the budget, we'll take uh, requests and uh, proposals from every department, every school, all the principals um, and department heads. And Todd and I will spend a couple of hours going through those proposals and trying to winnow them down, decide what's nice to have, what we absolutely need to do, um, and how would be the best way to do it. And remember that we're also looking at a five-year capital plan when we're building these things. So we're saying, okay, well, if we do this this year, then next year it would make sense to do that. So when we looked at Mike's list of potential capital projects, he had a number of things on the list. And one of the things that he thought was a pressing need was the uh, scoreboard in the plumber gym. He also said that at the same time, he talked to us about the score clock thing or the shot clock thing. He talked to us about alumni gym and said that, you know, someday we will probably need to make changes there as well if this MPA situation moves forward. Todd and I looked at that and said, oh, well, if we need to replace the, sh the scoreboard in plumber gym. Because it's failing. Because it's failing, because it's older, because it has, I think they're LED lights that don't function um, I forget exactly. I don't know the, the specific type of bulb that it is, but each, you know how on a score clock, each number is made up of multiple light bulbs. It's very cost, um, in effect, it's very costly to replace those individual bulbs when they burn out. All right, so we took the pressing need of Plumber Gem and said, okay, if we wanna do scoreboards at the high school, we're going to need to engage um, an electrician we're going to need to have a uh, high level scissor lift, which we're going to have to rent because they're gonna to have to go up and they're gonna to have to be working in the rafters. We're probably gonna need an engineering study. We're gonna need all of these things to make sure that this new scoreboard, these new scoreboards will work. If we're going to do it in plumber gym, it would be more cost effective to do both at the same time. 
because we would have the material, we would have the equipment, we would have the specialists there all at once. So Todd and I looked at this proposal and said, okay, well, if we're going to do plumber gym and we need to do that, we should probably do alumni as well. That had nothing to do with Mike's request, and it had nothing to do with shot clocks. It had to do with us assessing what was on the list of facilities, renovations, or upgrades that was needed to be taken care of, where they would fit into that five-year plan, what would be the most rational and efficient way of doing that. So I apologize to Mike for turning it into some, he doesn't know what the MPA wants conversation uh, because that's not really what it was. Right. Um, so on my blue chart, everybody's new favorite blue chart, what I would suggest is that we go back and defer the alumni gym scoreboard. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the efficiencies of it. And I mean, we could say, this group could say, we don't really want to do plumber gym either. But at the very least, we don't have to do alumni gym at the same time that we do plumber gym. Is plumber gym used for games? Yes. Basketball principally. For what, for what age group? Or type? So they do, um, they're more, more and more they've been doing like double headers. So sometimes there's a game in alumni gym and in plumber gym at the right. same time. Yeah, there's um, a lot of tournaments. I know the basketball in there. But isn't that only for like travel sports or something? Not, not for our own schools. No, the, they do use it for, community does use that gym, but they don't use our scoreboard and they don't use our sound system. That's just for school sponsored activities. So what school basketball games are occurring in double headers? JV and varsity sometimes, or um, like they might have a, a JV game in, in plumber gym and a varsity game in alumni, or um, I think if there's tournaments and things like that, they might be using both spaces. Because I've only seen it with, you know, JV goes first and then varsity, and then when they're doing like a, a tournament, it would be like a travel league that's in that gym. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure on the specific schedule of it, but that's, I do know for a fact that we only use it for school sponsored events. We don't allow community to use that the scoreboard or the sound system. I was just taking a quick look here because I have a bunch of emails back and forth about plumber. Um, the PE classes use plumber gym, mm -hmm. youth basketball tournament, cheerleading invitational, summer basketball leagues, youth basketball tournament. Um, and then he says that the our athletic department is probably not the largest user of the clock and sound system in plumber. Um, double header games for winter season and fall volleyball would be the um, our school based sports oh, that are in there. Yeah. yeah, I've seen cheering in there quite a bit as well, but I think that's practices rather than the. And they're not using the scoreboard. I don't think they use it. They use the sound. They don't system. need but the scoreboard. But we're talking about the sound system. They not use the, the scoreboard. Sound. The sound yeah. system is yeah. also in this budget, and um, so there's another line item on our capital, page two. Um, Mike asked Canfield, who's the sound system people, to go back and give us a more reduced scope of work and not to just replace exactly what's in there, but to do sort of a bare bones uh, sound system upgrade for us and came back with a, a smaller ask for that. Um, just a reduced project, basically, and said that they could get by with about half of what they had originally asked for. The original proposal was to replace the existing sound system with basically modern working versions of what, uh, what they currently have. Do you know how old the sound system is? Mm, I don't know if I have that. What's the difference between the mic microphone system and the sound system? The microphone system, is that under the auditorium that you're looking, Alicia? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, the auditorium, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, sorry. Um, sorry. that's the FCC that's doing us a favor by selling the wavelength that we just finished investing in all of our wireless mic equipment. Sorry. No, that's fine, it's confusing. Um, while Julie's looking 
for the information on the sound system. You had mentioned that it was a cost savings to do the lift and the electrician. Um, so would it be less than $40,000 if we deferred one of the scoreboards? I think it would be um, $40,000 to do the first one and then it might be a little bit more in an, in an ensuing year to do the second one. But what we would do is just go out and get a quote. Um, if we if we decide that that's the appropriate way to move forward to solve the plumber problem but not solve the um, non-existent exactly alumni problem, then uh, we'll just get a new quote and then we would plug in a real number. Okay. Um, one of the variables there in the working in the gyms is the fact that the cinder block wall, and so if there's any additional wiring that needs to be done, it can get a little bit expensive because Donnie can't pull wires through cinder blocks very easily. Um, so there's a little bit of money factored in there for electric, um, electrical work, which isn't necessarily, uh, we don't have a quote for that yet, but we could get one. system is, a, is is pretty much it yeah that's that we do have a quote for oh, right so I'm that one's that one's okay scoreboard. it's, it's okay. the scoreboard it's the question of is it really 80,000 divided by two or is there savings one way or the other now I get to see my left-handed one-handed token it's super efficient so I'll just ask are you guys okay Do we have a quote on the scoreboard? That's what Kate's saying. She's taking a note on it. Oh, I thought she said it. Yeah. I think Todd No, does we have a direct quote on the sound system. Yeah. That's how we got the refining I think pricing. Todd does have a quote on the scoreboard, but I don't think I have anything current about doing one versus two. Okay. So. Um, it potentially could be a little bit larger. Could be. general concept is that that's kind of where, where we're headed, that we would do one and not the other, then we can, we can nail that right down. I don't want to speak for you guys, but okay. And it can be, we get the right number in there and then we see where we are. I mean, none of this stuff is, is necessarily decided this minute, unless Sarah wants us to decide it this minute. Yeah. We have, what, two whole weeks? Yeah, yeah, so much, <laughs> so much time. I guess I'd love to know the the necessity for the plumber scoreboard based on school athletic use. Because just for confirmation purposes, Julie, you said that the the other entities don't use our scoreboard, right? So I have. Um, I requested data from community services, and this is what's tricky about it. They reserve it for most events, and then what the school department will do is block the gym out, mm -hmm. say, like, during the springtime. We may need to be in there for baseball. We may not. It's just so we'll block it out. So the data that we have isn't as pristine as I would want it to be to actually know what is the specific use. So it might say that the high school used plumber gym all this week, and really nobody mm -hmm. ever needed to go in there because the weather was good. Um, so what I, what I have here from um, the system that community services uses is rec track. And so they're able to go through and say like how many times it's been used, um, what are the fees that have been collected and things like that. Um, but I haven't had a chance, I just got it, so I yeah. haven't had a chance to really, some yeah. things are highlighted in green and orange so I don't totally know necessarily but um, how to decipher this. Because I'm assuming all we would need it for in plumber would be double headers for basketball and and volleyball. Right, because PE you don't you don't need a right. scoreboard. What, right, um, I think we're conflating a little bit the use of the, use the of gym the with, with the use, use of, of the scoreboard. scoreboard. Right, right. 
I mean, and the reality is it's a decision point. So right. if he can continue to replace bulbs as they fail, and it's just a matter of at what point does something, does it become more cost efficient to get a newer, upgraded, more efficient piece of equipment or keep putting money into a failing right. piece? Mm -hmm. That's. Well, how much are they for, to replace a bulb? Um, I don't think I have the specific cost of that, but I can find out. How much to replace the bulb? Like can we just use clip shirts like we did back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> Pay a guy to hold signs. All right, so we'll figure. We figure need to figure out what we're doing with scoreboard games on the um, Oh, and cost. So the auditorium, Kate, uh -huh. <coughs> that sound system is going to be unusable next year. That's what I hear. Yeah. Um, got this information from Matt Eaton, who is the gentleman who kind of manages our AV stuff in the, um, in the auditorium, and what he sent me was a disclosure from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, that basically said, we've sold the wavelength that your microfo uh, microphones operate on to another buyer, so you're not going to have access to them. Um, and it's, I believe it's to do with cellular phones, that the cellular, pho cellular phone wavelengths are expanding and they're giving more space on the spectrum to them. And I'm probably using all the wrong words because this is so not my area of expertise. Um, but the microphones and the receivers are tuned to a radio channel, basically, so that they can communicate. And um, the microphones I'm talking about are those little headsets that you see the, the yeah. kids use in the play so they can sing real loud and you can hear them in the background. Um, and so unfortunately what happens is that the, the equipment is specifically tuned to that wavelength or that channel and there's no way to retune it to some other channel. It's just become useless. Or you could still use it, but you would probably be having interference from things like cell towers and cell phone calls and stuff like that. So it, it would become fuzzy. And that's all supposed to take place in 2020. I believe in January is when the FCC has sort of said, yeah, y'all need to be out of here. Um, which means that we wouldn't necessarily have to go out and buy them the first day of the fiscal year, but that by the end of the fiscal year, they would be experiencing problems. With what, it. I mean, how do we prevent that? First of all, is there no recourse from the seller? Um, I really don't know what our legal recourse would be. Um, oh, do you mean from the, the person that we purchased the microphones from? It's kind of not their fault. Well, who, who assigns the wavelength? If the um, wavelength is attached to the equipment. I think the wavelength was always open until right now, and I think the sellers have been sort of you know, smacked as well. They've probably got microphones sitting on their shelves that they'll never be able to sell because the FCC said you don't, you can't have that wavelength anymore. And how do we guarantee that doesn't happen again? That I do not know. Yeah. <laughs> that I do not know. I mean, if there, there's probably other technology out there that doesn't use radio frequencies, but I don't know what that would be and I, I, I don't know how expensive that would be. Can you get the letter or something, the FCC letter, just to sure. understand that a little bit more? Absolutely. Presumably this isn't just a us problem. Right. This is happening, affecting other people as well. Oh, absolutely. Anybody's. I mean, that's a lot of money. That, that is a lot of money with no guarantee that it won't happen again. But you buy that how equipment about, and then they um, don't. Just for the sake of process, how about I drop a question into our Q&A? That's a great idea. And then I can cut and paste some of the FCC stuff that's that I got. Yeah, back thank up. you. I know. Off <laughs> frequency wireless mics. <laughs> we should we probably. Like to, we should probably be somewhere. At now. Yeah, somewhere. they're they're shaking their heads at us they're so like, hard right now. There's some, please stop talking. Some guys. serious Don't medical say frequency thinking going again. on. Right now. Don't say microphone again. Oh my goodness. All right. So I'm gonna just say, make a note here. I need more information about. just drop in what I have from, from them about it. 
Great. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. We have already Googled it and found some information about some chirping, so. Yep. Um, it includes there being um, fines and criminal penalties if you don't get off the service. Ooh, ooh great. Uh -oh. Let's not do that. So I should increase the legal account, too, while we're at it. Uh, Holy that. moly. Pay now or pay later. Yay, government. Speaking of CIP, um, do you remember, Julie, how much was how much remained in the impact fee budget after we got the acorn show? Um, I I don't know if I have it in this notebook specifically, but I believe there was probably around a hundred thousand dollars plus or minus ten to twenty thousand. And was that after? The yeah. use of impact fees at a normal level in the debt service? Right, correct. And right. so I don't know if within the town budget that has already been reallocated to offset debt service this year, which then would change the whole bottom line for all of us, or if it was left sitting in that fund. So I it mean, may have been your applied school to school impact fees, so they shouldn't be reallocating it. Right. Well, but remember, historically, the way that impact They're fees have been used has been to pay down smaller. debt service. So, yeah, and that... Which that is 10% of our budget, separately. Our debt service budgeted expenditure amount right now is based on what we know we already owe plus a placeholder for the May 2019 uh, bond issue, which Ruth is working on right now. Um, so if we were to find that we actually owed less in debt service, then I think that's where we would see that, right? We're um, no, I think we are... I don't think we're going to have less debt than we expect, <laughs> so to speak, but my understanding is that one of the, the, one of the things the town manager was talking about um, when it came to debt service and why there happens to be this surplus of funds, if you will, available this year is remember that debts, the, the school impact fees are typically two years out. So the money that we're, the amount of money available we're looking at today is from two years ago, was collected two years ago. And so typically, um, and I'm just going to use a hypothetical number, so please don't quote me on this. Let's say we normally use $700,000 to pay down debt service each year. This year, there's a million, right? Um, and so that left that $300,000 plus above what we would normally be able to, what we were normally paying down on our debt service. And so what Tom was saying is that we could apply it all to debt service this year, but then next year we'll have a big gap because we're Our debt service cost will be that much right, higher. Above and beyond. And so um, it was th the timing of it made it appropriate for us to seek those funds outside of budget cycles to fund this project. So I think all we have to do is go back to the manager and say, are there still school impact fee funds available or have we applied them to debt service within this budget proposal? I think one of the questions that we already did ask during the course of the eight corners project conversations we've been having is um, if it's two years out, then what does last year look like? Is it back to sort of normal levels? And I don't kind of remember where that. Yeah, I don't think we were able to project. The question we asked was, is there a way is for us to be able to, to anticipate or project? And, and the reason I ask that is because if you look at, if we're still in capital improvement under the technology section, there's about 100 over $100,000 that's due to outgoing new classroom releases mm -hmm. that um, I think there's a strong argument there that similar to the trailers that that could be needed to address student growth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can yeah, it is true. What's that? It is true. Yeah. I think the challenge there, and I would have to go back and read specifically the language in the charter is, do we consider that bricks and mortar from today's day and, mm -hmm. you know, day and age? Because it does specifically speak to bricks and mortar, and I don't think it's those specific words, but I would just want to read the charter closely and see if there is it's true. Um, applicability. Well, to Sarah's point, if there is a balance and available um, impact fees, we could put them towards the boilers. That was something that we had said was, yeah. was certainly, would be something that would qualify. I don't know if that would because they're, the boilers are needing to be replaced because they've aged out. It's not because of new growth. Oh, I see. Where right. is that? Okay. Well, don't we have the portables? The next round of portables in the budget? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Which I mean, is an option. Right. Yeah. 
I mean, I guess, I think at this point it would be important to remember that in the capital budget, you've got items that are financed, bonded, leased, and items that are appropriated. So if our goal is to reduce the tax request from the schools in this current fiscal year, then the things that we would want to focus on would be the things that were going to be appropriated. And so the town manager and the town finance director are the people who actually make the decision about how mm -hmm. to finance mm -hmm. things. We say, right. here's our budget, we'd like this money, and they decide how that happens. But if we're trying to eliminate a cost to the town, then we would want to look at things that were going to be a direct cost to the town, um, meaning things that were not planned to be bond, uh, bonded, yeah, bonded, things right. that were planned to be appropriated. And is there anything in there that's so if you look in your budget for, if we go to the capital section, if you have the town budget book, it's tab five, um, where you can then see what's scheduled to be bonded, what's scheduled to be appropriated. Um, and I'm not sure, Kate, what does T mean? Uh, T, where's T? On page 54. I didn't bring that one with me. I just brought a printout of it here. Trade in. Trade in. Okay, thank you. Um, and then. <laughs> thank you. Appropriate. R. Oh, R is reserve funds. Okay. So that's the coding that you see mm -hmm. used in there. So B bond, A appropriate, a trade in, and reserve. What do you call it? There's a ledger. Le legend somewhere there. Um, so, and then if you. So there's all the municipal stuff um, kind of on the first few pages, and then you get to the school section on page 59. And so here's where you can see um, how things originally in first reading, but remember already that maintenance truck, it says appropriate here, mm -hmm. um, but the town it has lumped that in with four other vehicles to be financed. We talked about that earlier. So the outfit new classroom spaces with technology, that's scheduled to be bonded. And then um, additional teacher staff devices appropriated, switch, the $5,000 switch for K2 appropriated. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And what was so, the other trailer? Sorry. So the eight corners um, classrooms is scheduled to be bonded. The two classrooms. The so can we put a can, can we put a um, question in there to um, read the charter and and see if there is any way we can use any of that for the appropriated. So I'm going to put a note that says um, our. Mm -hmm. Could that be shifted to bonded to reduce by 175000 Yeah, that was one of the items that Tom and I spoke about in our original thinking about this. And as you know, last night the Finance Committee made some recommendations of things that they are going to be shifting. Um, I, unless you guys have, I think first we just need to know, are there anything anything you want to, to remove or postpone from the CIP budget? And then I can work with Tom to decide what can be appropriated and what can be bonded if that makes sense, but the input that we really need from you tonight is of these projects that you see listed in that detail that Kate has provided, are there any that you think should be deferred? Um, and I'll just circle back to where we started the conversation, IE scoreboards. That could be, if you think that could be deferred, um, that's important for us to know. I think that's a possibility. I'd like the, some of those more specific yeah. questions answered. And then the school buses, um, Replacements mm -hmm. actually um, 
Mr. Pritchard asked about how many buses we had and how many were sitting, and if there were a number, he probably asked you that too. Mm-hmm. Do you have the answer to that? So I don't know if I, I know this question gets asked yearly. I don't know that I saw the specific question this year, but we have 22 buses, I believe, in total. I think we have a, I have to count them. We have 22 drivers, but we have. I think we wish we had 22 drivers, but I think we have 22 buses. Okay. But we'll get, we'll get clear on that. So, but the goal is. Can I tell you what the budget book says? Yes. Just to be specific. There you go. So for FY19, it says 19 FTEs. Drivers. Drivers. And then it says the district owns 29 buses and four minivans. There we go. There you go. So the question was, if we owe, own 29 buses and we only have 19 drivers, what are we doing with those buses and why are we asking for more? So the vehicles are on a replacement cycle. I think you know that our buses are maintained by Public Works. Yes. And so the reason that you would want to replace a bus on an annual schedule, regardless of the mileage necessarily on that bus, is because of its age and its roadworthiness and its insurability. Okay. So the reason that we have three buses instead of two buses, which was our usual replacement cycle for a number of years, is that in 2004 and 2005, we bought 12 total buses through CIP. We made a massive fleet improvement, which was a great idea at the time because our fleet was in trouble. But in retrospect, it wasn't such a great idea because now all of those buses are aging out at the same time. So this is the last year that we're, if we want to stay on cycle to have buses off the road after 10 years, which is our recommended lifespan, we would do three buses this year and then we can go back to two buses next year. One of the cool things about this year is that we were able to obtain a grant from the State Department of Environmental Protection, which is through the VW settlement. And so that we are slated to get money back from the state, but you can't, you can only get it as a, not a rebate, refund. You have to buy the bus. It's not money up front. Yeah. It's money that's given to you the year after, after you've shown that you've made that purchase. So the actual cost to the district, a portion of that third bus will be paid for through the VW settlement. It should be about two thirds, three quarters of the bus. 75,000 I think is the amount. So what about the 10 extra buses though? Are we holding on to 10 extra buses and is there a way that we can get reimbursed? That we could, that we could downsize our fleet? Well, I guess the, the question is what's our long-term strategy? You know, I mean, up until now our long-term strategy was holy crap, we'd really like to have enough drivers to drive those buses. You always need some extra buses in the yard because buses break down. So you wouldn't want to have 22 drivers and 22 vehicles because we all know vehicles, right? So buses are finicky just like everybody else's car. Could we have 20 drivers and 25 buses and could we sell some? That's, that's a strategic question and it's worth considering. Well, and if, if, and when we can fully staff, we use all the buses between trips, fourth, regular transportation. So I think we use 21 or 22 buses just to do when we're fully staffed to do our daily morning and afternoon runs. And then as you know, there's multiple sporting activities or clubs that need transportation after school. So we, how can we use more drive, more buses than we have drivers? We do currently have more buses than we have drivers. Right. So you're saying we use 21 buses in a day, but we only have 19 drivers. But those are not fully staffed. Like if we were fully staffed, if we could be fully staffed, we would have 21, 22 buses on the road every morning and every afternoon. And then you have your sports and extracurricular activities. So I'm trying to help you understand why there's 29 buses in the yard. Right. And remember that, well, maybe you don't remember because I haven't said it to you yet, but we do have spare drivers. In the good old days of plenty of bus drivers, we would have four or five spare drivers and many of them only drove for sports trips or only drove for field trips. In which case, you know, that driver would have another bus while everybody else was out doing their regular runs. I guess I'm interested in somewhat of an analysis of, we've got 10 extra buses and how old they are. If they're 10 year, 
camera, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we've got we've got a list of you know what yeah. the vehicles are, what the mileage is on them, what their um, uh, lifespan is, if you will, you know when they when they were built, um, and. It sounds like it's a more more of a strategic conversation though than just knowing like about the vehicles themselves. It's like the use of them, right? So right. Well, we yeah. need to have like a oh, a conversation. Maybe Sarah could help us put something together that explains where the buses are at any given moment, so that we know that we're using our assets appropriately. Or, or when? I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I guess she doesn't have a crystal ball, but I mean, if if we're at eight eight years or six years, I mean, realistically speaking, are we going to be able to? get all of those buses out on the road by the time that they're they're still good or we better to cut our losses now and, and resell them. Uh, meaning the older ones, right. Right? right? Yeah, so take them off the road right. sooner. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'd be curious to know if we didn't do the three buses, well, let's say we didn't do two because the, it seems like we should do one if we're getting 75% of the paid for. Is there any, what's the impact to to the students. Um, one thing I will say about the older buses is that once they're more than 10 years old, you can't get insurance that will cover them for replacement value. Okay. Um, so that's an issue uh, that we have faced occasionally. Um, if a bus, an older bus is in an accident, they'll say, you know, it's kind of like an older car. They'll say, well, here's your $2,000. Well, you can't go out and necessarily buy a bus for $2,000. Um, but they've, the insurance companies have a cutoff point where they'll say, well, we're not replacing that vehicle for you. Well, I think that if they're recommending 10 years, we shouldn't have them on right. the road after 10 right. years. I would never suggest that. But you're just thinking but in terms of downsizing, downsizing with the, the newer ones as well. The well, other thing the efficiency just, and the optics don't. Just sort of talking great. about it in general, like where we're at and what this means. And yeah. Right. And, and is this the new normal? Are we going to be able to actually get bus drivers like we keep yeah. hoping and praying that we right. Well, and the do. other thing, too, I'm wondering, um, I, I hear the desire to downsize the fleet. Um, I don't think it makes the best sense to do that by not investing in new buses because new buses have new safety features, more cameras, and the new, um, we're making sure that every bus has the, um, all clear feature that's my words I don't know what it's really called so you've heard stories of children falling asleep on buses and yeah. spending the night in the bus barn or wherever um, and so now all of our new buses have not instead of four cameras five cameras um, and they also have that uh, the bus driver literally can't leave the bus without going and checking all the seats and pressing that there's like a safety button in the back otherwise it makes an alarm um, go off so that everyone knows that this bus hasn't been checked. And so th that's one of the safety features among others that comes with the new more efficient buses as well. So, Thank you. Um, but I think there's a way to think about our, you know, can we offload three buses? Um, and only replace, you know, and get two or. Right. Let's, yeah, let's talk yeah. about it. And yeah, I think we'll have to connect yeah, with public. Yeah, I'm putting it into our, this is, I'm using the DOE questions, the big spreadsheet thing, that's just that's for right. a Perfect. simple place to put things. And, um, could we downsize the fleet based on our current experience? I mean, I just want to be clear, though. These are questions and conversations. It doesn't mean that, that by asking them, I'm advocating, first of all, for a, a certainly not for an unsafe bus. Oh, no, no, no. Fleet. I mean, and, and, and I'm not even advocating for any outcome. I just think that the responsible thing to do is to have these conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Absolutely. I think, you know, what we're saying is can we provide the safety, the, the right. services that we need to provide at a lower cost? And that's a fair, fair question. It's always a fair question. Is there anything else in the capital that you guys think of those questions I uh, think should be deferred or removed altogether? Other than, so what Julie's put in um, for, for Kate in the blue section, mm -hmm. um, I, I would love, we're going to get a quote or try to get a quote from the alumni. Yep, a gyms more accurate quote, quote. Scoreboard. I agree with the um, plumber gym sound system. And then I'd be interested in, you know, 
considering the plumber, plumber gym and some of the other things, having convers additional conversations about some plumber. of the other CRPs that we talked Getting about. a little more clear on the cost. Yeah. So if you go through and just as a matter of closing out the CIP, um, does everyone have clarity on the tech equipment replacement and why that's needed? We're good. Right on the first page of this chart here. Just to go through any clarifying questions about the new tech equipment. This is related to um, the new the K2 no. classrooms. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the only, um, if you want to call it a decision point here, is the way that we've laid it out in, in um, furnishings and tech equipment in the coming year is that we will have potentially six new classrooms. So if you say, well, we really know that we are going to have four new classrooms, but we might have two more after that, do we want to reduce the ask for tech and furnishings to four acknowledge classrooms. that there might be four classrooms instead of six. Does that make sense? Do we get economies of scale by go doing these for six? Are there any benefits? Um, I would say for the furnishings, yes. For the, um, for the tech, maybe not so much because it's not huge numbers. Like if you're talking Chromebooks, buying 60 versus Hundred is probably not going to be a, a price point. The furnishings probably yeah, okay. um, but we could do quotes a couple of different ways too. I guess what's the the wonder is we do have in our budget in CIP the other two classrooms, and that we don't necessarily have to spend the money if we don't um, implement those two other classrooms. Well, we it, just have we, the budgetary authority to do it, right? right? And we wouldn't. So I think that's the important thing. This 88.9 here is to furnish six classrooms. We know for a fact we're bringing four classrooms online for this school year. Right. And then the other part that's out there is the two additional um, modulars at eight corners. I think that you know every day we're kind of getting reaffirmed that our projections are accurate, um, if not low. Um, so I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm going to project that you're going to end up needing those classrooms. And if you Remember, we don't spend it if we don't need it. Just because it's in here, does it gives us the opportunity to if the need arises. If not, you're then waiting for the next budget cycle and putting it into the next. So that's, that is a decision point. Um, I have a lot of Chromebooks, so I don't really need to. Well, no, and the other that. question is, Very basic. It does it really get to our end goal, which is to reduce the tax no, request and the um, tech for the classrooms is considered bonded on this one and um, looking for furnishings the new classroom furnishings on the chart I'm looking at is appropriated so that would maybe be a place but the it's not big bucks. But you said you thought the furnishings you'd get a deal when you do right. get a better deal That's when you do tables and chairs. Yeah. yeah, tables, chairs, desks, cubbies, anything that you see that looks like a piece of furniture when you walk into a K classroom. I mean, honestly, a, I just feel like it's it's small such potatoes. A significant, yeah, it's small and it's such a significant need. If it happens, then it's not even worth it. Okay, so then let's just keep going down the line. Facilities and maintenance projects. Um, just take a look and skim and scan through there if there's any clarifying questions or, um, I mean, every single thing is a choice, but as you know, one of the things that was very clearly articulated during the Leadership Council meeting was how underfunded facilities um, have been. And so just keeping that in mind here, we have some roof restoration scheduled, um, some painting at the middle school, Replacing and retrofitting inadequate features. Um, replacing the leaking skylights at the middle school gym. Masonry repairs and exterior doors. Kind of on this page here. I've, I've already reviewed it and uh, like I said at the town council meeting, I think that the needs here are so shocking mm -hmm. that I can't even imagine crushing any of that, that budget. Okay. And we're 50% we're less than the recommended, what, what the state recommends for, yeah. for right. facilities, I just. 
we were just talking about that. I mean, the, the, we've spent so much time in the past few months talking about facilities and the needs and you know the fact that we're just kind of keeping our heads above water trying to keep things moving and to go in and st sort of start taking apart the five-year plan again just to look for a small a savings a is, 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 um, is maybe not the place we want to start. I mean, I mean if, if we are talking about not painting our schools, not replacing leaky fixtures, we really need to have the you talk about our priorities, and we mm -hmm. we really need to have a serious discussion that is really bad. And I agree. I mean, replace middle school failing toilets is one of the <laughs> items. <laughs> I'm gonna leave yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Advocate for those. <laughs> um, and I did t I did talk with Todd today. Kate and I both did. If there were any projects that he could recommend being deferred and what the impact would be, and he hands down said, please, please, oh please, not HVAC. So. Um, I heard Bob Bob there there yeah. 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 yeah, which is the sig a significant portion here that I believe is mostly scheduled to be bonded um, with the exception of the high school Wentworth HVAC, not Wentworth High School HVAC controls. It's 115,000 that's scheduled to be bonded as well. Um, the district wide HVAC repairs is scheduled to be bonded and then the trailers is what's on this page. So that's all currently all scheduled to be bonded. The truck we talked about on the next page, um, and then this is the classroom furnishings, which we just talked about, the high school auditorium equipment, which is the wireless microphones, which we discussed, athletics, and then transportation. Yep. So that wraps it up. And then on the back sheet here, you have sort of a schedule of what CIP has looked like over the last several years slightly higher this year, but considering some of the significant repairs, it's not astronomical. I think, I mean, we could go in order for the sake of just following if there's, if you have specific line items that you have questions with. Um, the big, it starts with middle school and then goes to Wentworth for regular instruction, works through the schools. We talked about the ed techs, which I know that was a big question. Um, you all saw the response to course reimbursement. And again, that that's something that can be a choice moving forward for the board. Um, in the contract, the way that it reads is that teachers, this year they had until June 30th to submit their course reimbursement plans. Um, and then that's how we determine how much we allocate in the budget. It's based on actual enrollments. Uh, we do budget um, a, a small amount for new staff that may be hired after the budget cycle begins um, because it's a contractual ob obligation. Here's a complete breakdown for you by school. And one of the things that um, you notice at the high school, which has a significant increase this year, is we actually have a cohort of high school teachers who are part of a leadership cohort. Um, and that's something we have not yet had high school teachers be a part of this, so it's really exciting for us. And that's why you see such a significant increase there. I can't remember, uh, we could do the quick math to figure out how many folks are doing that, but they have in their contract up to nine credits reimbursed at the USM rate is how we calculate that. And then they can apply for additional um, credits to be reimbursed at the superintendent's approval. And um, that hasn't happened this year that I'm aware of. I think everyone's within the, the guidelines of the contract. So I, I thank you, Kate, for putting it all in one spot because it's sort of throughout each school plan. Yeah, and I, um, put a response into our Q&A spreadsheet. Um, what number is that, Kate? Oh, hang on. I just lost the last one. It was until I messed around with it. At the very bottom, yeah. Alicia. 13. Line 14. 14. Um, yeah, so uh, just to be a little more precise about the process, what happens is under the teacher's collective bargaining agreement, there's a requirement that the teachers submit a professional development plan to central office each year. And I believe it's by January 30th. I, 
end of January each year for the following year, which allows us to build a list of all the teachers who are in programs who, who are going to be approved to have credits paid for. Um, and so we actually have the, the sort of real list. And so on this chart that I just handed out, that first column is people who already have a plan in place to take courses and we've said that that's okay. Um, and then the second column um, is estimated for new hires. And since we uh, discovered in the past couple of years that we've had folks come in to the district who are already in a de degree program or they're already working through, um, you know, working toward their masters, they've come in the door and said, hey, what do y'all do for course reimbursement? And in most districts, there's not really a requirement for you to sign up ahead of time or to know a year in advance. Um, so we felt that it wasn't necessarily fair to exclude those folks, especially if they were already in an existing program and just trying to continue with what they were already doing in another district. So this year we built in a little bit of extra um, to support those folks. And the numbers that you see in that second column with three classes, two classes, one class, are based on what we know about new positions and turnover. Mm -hmm. So you know, if we know that somebody's retiring and someone new is coming in, then there's a chance that person that we hire might have um, a need for, uh, to take a course. And we would wanna be able to honor that under the teacher's collective bargaining agreement. So we built in a little bit of a cushion there. Um, and just know that we only um, allow or approve courses to the degree that we have money to support it. Um, so what we have in the budget is essentially a cap on what we can allow teachers to take. Right. And the, the past couple of years, we've worked really hard on trying to get that prior knowledge rather than just sort of you know do a survey, are you in a master's program? We really have like specific prior approval um, months before the new fiscal year so that we can we can have accurate numbers. So the only decision point you have here is whether or not to create the opportunity for new hires to who are currently enrolled to access that benefit for the collective bargaining agreement. How, which how many of these are how do we So um any idea, I don't know what I'm trying to talk about my story, but any idea of the um, rate of retention for the number of new hires? Like, so do we get do we get in a, a return on our investment if we pay for that? Do they stay? Most of our, um, we have a lot of longevity in our district. Um, last year, I mean, I think you can just look at retirement, right? Uh, I have not done a years of service analysis since FY17, um, but we certainly, it's a big project, but I, I'm happy to try to squeeze that in in the next 60 days. Um, <laughs> it took a little longer than that the first time, but um, what I would say is you look at the longevity of your teaching staff, and the majority of your staff are at the top of the scale. So that tells me that the answer to that is yes, you do have a good return on investment. And one of the things Leanne and I were having a lengthy discussion about is the value of that HR specialist is to help ensure that we get that return on investment by um, really amping up recruitment or retention strategies mm -hmm. with folks. But here in Scarborough, we're a pretty de we're a pretty de desirable district. Folks want to come here and want to stay here when they get here for the most part. Well, I think that that, Anecdotally, that you know, $18,000 goes towards that. I mean, it's yeah. more expensive if, if we have turnover and to Absolutely. pay for that. So I mean, 18,000 is, in my mind, if it, if and we, and we may never it. access all of right. that because, again, it's dependent upon prior Actual enrollment. Actual enrollment. Right. 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 Are you coming to right. us already right. enrolled? Right. Not coming in September and saying, like, ooh, now I want to take some courses. Because in that case, I do, in every single new hire, my conversation is to make them aware of this benefit and make sure that they know the timeline. So they would know that, okay, plan for that for next year. Put it in by January. And it, it is a way for us to be competitive with other school districts because it's a very common benefit that's offered um, for teaching staff, um, partly because they need to keep up their classes for certification, but also because we want them to be able to progress and continue learning. And so um, it's a way for us to have a benefit package that parallels the benefit packages in other surrounding communities for teachers. And we want to keep them. Right, so if I'm a teacher and I'm looking around for a new job and Scarborough has course reimbursement and Gorham doesn't, 
okay, that's a decision point for me, right, if I'm in a master's program. Well, and so. specifically, correct me if I'm wrong, specifically what we're talking about are people who are currently enrolled in a program. Exactly. Who know that they right. have that expense. Exactly. So, so I, I know that this is, is an expense of mine, and I'm looking at one district, and I'm looking at another district, and one has that reimbursement and the other doesn't. That's That would right. certainly be a factor in my It's, it's definitely going to influence where you might yeah. uh, choose to be employed. Well, it gets us out of retention issues, I think, is the thing. That's it's, the an it's an attraction issue, really. Because they'll get it the second time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well it districts. also has to do with retention. If we're reimbursing their courses and they stay a year or two and then take flight for another district, you well, know, no, will but we they'll have get it as part that. of their CEA the next year, is, is, is my point. Yes. That yes. It's just yes. attraction. Right. Do we actually, to your point, do we have any qualifications, like if they get this, they have to remain on for... No. Okay. There's no contingency clause. Okay. Good question. We have that at my company. Mm -hmm. yeah, we put out right, if like you get reimbursed, then you have to stay. Then right. you have to get... Yeah, so and that, there are, is that something that... And you have to get an A. That would, that would have <laughs> you to, you have that's to get a good, like a certain grade. <laughs> that you have to bargaining. That, that's bargaining. Yep. Okay. Let you do have that. to be successful in the course. You can't yeah. flunk it. So that's in there. <laughs> what's, okay. that, what's our um, grade a beer better. requirement? You have to, have to have a beer better okay. in the oh, class. Oh, you do? A beer? I think that's still okay. in the language, yeah. isn't it? We're going to bump that to a B plus. <laughs> am I, am I, I making I, that High wrong? standard. I don't <laughs> recall that language. Okay. So maybe I'm recalling the last contract. So... Um, I, some questions yeah, for I'm you. not going to look it up now, but we it's but I but I you know it's not it's not a um, you're required to stay on with us if <laughs> we've never retained anyone. Else. And, and I don't think you would really want to do that because there's yeah. a variety of reasons why you want folks to stay, but also why you might want folks to yeah. Yeah. move on down the road. I think it's more making sure that they're in an accredited program, and then I think it's incumbent upon us to say, how is this going to improve your practice? And that's where our energy is best mm -hmm. spent. Okay. So that was another big one here within the individual school lines. I don't know if you guys have any other things, burning questions. I did have one, I'm just trying to find. Oh, postage, postage was a question. Yes, do you want me to talk about that one? Or do you want Kate to talk about that? I don't, but they, oh, there's a lot budgeted and we don't use very much. What the heck postage? Okay, so <laughs> so postage is, is one of my favorite lines. Um, what happened is that in FY17, our postage costs were really high. Really high. Like really high. And we sort of had this, why is this happening? What the heck is wrong um, situation? And my, my colleague, Renee, who is... Uh, Bulldog and a vendor genius um, worked with the Pitney Bowes to figure out what the heck was going wrong, and it turned out that there were billing errors, and they gave us a massive credit. So the, the massive was credit like duplicating the bills. Just so it was it was accumulating basically instead of clearing, yeah. um, clearing the account when we were paying the bill. So we received a massive credit from them, which helped us not spend that money most of last year in this FY18 and then half of this year and now we're back to spending the money and now the FY20 budget represents what we normally would spend on postage. So if it hadn't been for vendor craziness, it would have been a much steadier right. normal um, trajectory over those four years. And we do mail much, um, very little actually. Um, it's just the sheer volume of the mailing. And that one thing that we do mail every year is, is test scores yeah. in grades oh, three through eight. Kind of so that's something that people want to have a hard copy of. They should have a hard copy of. Um, and it shouldn't be something that's emailed because it's a student record. Yeah. And so you know that you get it. Yeah. 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 Yep. Right. Look at, um, but most everything else we do electronically, as you know, parents. Uh, can you, what does Pitney Bowes do? They, do they do just the address thing, sending it? Um, no, it's our postage meter. Okay. So it's actually, it's the actual postage. We use the Pitney Bowes postage meter because if you have metered mail, it costs a little bit less per unit than putting stamps on things. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so let's just look at some of 
Oh, yeah, here's like middle school, but yeah, high school. Look at middle school right here. So you have a big number, then you have like, oh, we didn't spend anything. Then you have the budgeted amount, we spend like much less than the budgeted amount because of the credit. And then, but this is what we really anticipate it costing us. Okay. So any other questions about regular instruction? The next is ESL. I don't think there's anything too out of the ordinary there. Um, I would mention that in the the budget categories that you're looking at in the line item, they're, they're li laid out in the budget categories that the voters vote on. Um, some of the categories are super concentrated with human beings, personnel costs make a difference. This kind of goes to that conversation about the ed techs where you're, if your budget category is made up almost entirely of people, then personnel costs might drive a different type of change than if you have a lot of contracted services, or like if you look at facilities, you've got utilities in there that are part of the mix. Um, so it's that um, being conscious of when you see an increase, a percent change in a, in a category, what might be driving that. And ESL comes to mind because it's basically all people. Right. Nothing there. The next section is gates. So this is gifted and talented um, instruction. Same story as ESL that this Kate just told you. Slightly different um, twist on that one is that in gates we have one employee who's retiring and um, so we have a retirement stipend in there as well, which is not typical for that department. Um, but other than that, everything's pretty much the same. And again, it's all personnel costs for the most part. Can I ask a general Gates question that probably would have been more appropriate for the workshop, but I'm just now thinking of it. Um, how come it's listed as K-8? To, do we have a program at the K-2? Like what services do the Gates educators provide to students at the K-2 phase level, and really it's not until fourth grade. Right. Um, I think so it's why more have it embedded listed? in the instruction. We're required to have a Gates program, and every year Allison puts in a plan to the state that then gets approved. Um, and But it's not necessarily appropriate to identify a child that young. I mean, it can happen where they might require some supplemental or um, replacement type of instruction because they are so brilliant. Um, but typically that happens within the classroom setting. It's not a pull out model like it is right. in some of the other grades. Right, and, and to your point, April, the, the K-8 designation, it does come from the state. So they divide things into K-8 and 9-12 when they ask us for reporting. So it's almost like a, a financial piece and a, an accounting piece more than it is like identifying the actual programming that we have in schools. Yep. Interesting. Thank you. That answers it perfectly. The next is special services. And this, I will say, um, all today they were having um, IEP meetings with incoming K students. So we're, we're continuing to do that. There's, I think, eight different days scheduled between now and actually the last one happens the day of our second reading. Um, so we uh, can anticipate that there may be some refinements as they have those conversations and really assess, you know, what services mm -hmm. those incoming students might need. But that work is well underway. Um, I have not gotten a new number since the last time I reported, so. Then CTE is the career technical education. Um, and this is an area that we're actually getting some clarification on. You can see that we've budgeted 9,000 here. Um, and if you look at the history for CTE, you'll see that we went from budgeting 250, 300,000 down to 9,000. Um, but then in, you look at what we actually, the projected actual for FY19 is much lower. And this is because the the funding mechanism shifted at the state level. So rather than us receiving part of the funding through our formula, um, it's now directly 
directly funded to the CTEs. And so what um, we're looking into is, do we need to have this buffer in the budget? Will there be any bills coming our way that we might need to cover? Okay. So um, when this the funding model shifted for the first time this year, so um, there was some discussion among the Vogue schools, and we use PATHS and um, Westbrook Vocational, Regional Vocational Center as our two sending schools. Um, when we were meeting with the leaders of those schools, they were trying to learn from the state what it was that they were going to get for funding and would it be sufficient to cover their programming. And there was sort of a caveat that if there were items that they needed to operate, um, they needed funding to operate that wasn't provided by the state, that they would be turning back to the sending schools and saying, hey, guess, guess what, guys, you still owe us mm -hmm. some money. So that's where we, we still have some uncertainty because this is the first year that we're living that model. Um, and my, I did put it as one of my items in motion. I'm going to reach out to them um, now that the Vogue schools have probably been building their budgets to find out if they have any expectation that we'll owe them anything in the coming year. And that could be something we could reduce. It could be something we could take out. I hope it's not something that they say, well, yeah, actually, we're going to ask you for 15000 That would be a bad mm -hmm. surprise, right? um, <laughs> But we'll ask the question and find that out. Can I uh, throw in a, that you do have to have an A or a B? We don't have to have an A or a B. <laughs> <laughs> what? Cake founder <laughs> in the language. B and B, what? Cake founder for in your the book language. course, for Julie, your, that oh, you're taking. Oh, you no, for, for course reimbursement or course prepayment, a a yeah, there's a, there's a requirement that you have to attain a grade of an A or B. You have to complete the course. You have to oh. succeed. Yeah. Succeed. Yeah. And Sarah's going to change that to a B plus. <laughs> An A, only an A. The next section is our other instruction, which includes athletics and extracurriculars. So, we've got a high school athletic director, an assistant athletic director, a middle school athletic director, and then part-time athletic director, I don't know what Clark. it's Clark, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, do we really need all of those positions? I would say yes. Um, and so we have one athletic director and then we have an assistant of athletics. He's not an, an assistant director, he's an hourly employee and he assists with all the game setup, takedown, supervising games, scheduling, um, a lot of the tech advances that we've had with um, the athletics department has been a direct result of this person and his role. Um, at the middle school, we have a teacher, a middle school teacher who receives a stipend to oversee middle school athletics. Um, simply logistics, they're often running programs at the exact same times in different places, some away, some home. Um, and so he oversees directly that, but he also works with um, the students directly in terms of eligibility. So if there's a student who's um, at the middle school who is underperforming or showing signs of at-risk behavior, he w develops a plan with those students directly to help them um, improve their academics so that they can continue to be eligible. Um, and he also oversees like some of the 504s at the um, middle school. At the high school, Mike Legage is our athletic director. Um, he oversees all of the programming K-12. That includes Wentworth extracurriculars as well. If you see that some of that here in the budget, we've made some of those shifts here in coordinating all of that, working directly with community services around the shared services for the overall fields and um, coordination of that. And he serves part of his um, responsibilities at the high school is he's part of the building leadership team. So he's a fourth member of that leadership team and he does all of the like medical 504s, um, which has all those meetings and make sure that those modifications are put in place. And then our, the, I don't know, if I'm saying clerk, that's the role that most people could associate. I'm not sure what kind of creative title we have, but she runs the office um, portion of the athletics department and she's a part-time hourly employee. It just seems redundant to me at, at, from as an outsider. Mm -hmm. 
the, um, the other person, I'm sorry, Richard, the other person that's in the, um, there was a question on Amy's list about the different line items mm -hmm. um, and the athletic, the line that in, includes the salary for the athletic director also includes the athletic trainer, so. Um, oh, I it's saw not that. really labeled that way, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry I cut you off. That's no, so that's okay. Ahead. And do we have an athletic trainer and a part-time athletic trainer as well? We have one athletic trainer who is full-time on staff, um, contracted salary and benefits. That's Joe Davis. And then we have uh, a contract with me, medical partners, for a part-timer um, who assists us. And that's a contracted service, so he's not an employee. Right. Um, so he's part of that contracted services line. And right. Yeah. Is that something standard to have athletic trainers for the high school level? Yeah. Athletic trainers and athletic trainer at the high school level is definitely a standard. Really? Yeah. yeah. Particularly with concuss concussion management, That's huge. Um, there's a state requirement and mandate now that there's um, con concussion testing and concussion protocols. So that's basically a full time job in and of itself. The concussion testing and protocol. Well. The concussion testing, does that need to be done on site or can yeah. that be done? Is that yeah. They do pre-testing. They use a software, but they... I'm aware with, of the software and that sort of thing, but yeah. so like my son had a concussion and it took him to his doctor and got the testing to find out what it, you know, where he was at and... Do they do baseline testing? Because that's what, well, what our guys do. in middle school, so he, he uh, was too early. He was for too soon for baseline, that, yeah. But, so I'm just... The requirement is that the testing occur at the school, is what they're saying, the, the concussion testing. I don't know if that's actually in the law. But yeah, I'm not sure about the specific requirement. Um, but I was trying to see, I don't know if it's in this, but if you were to look at, we've been starting to gather more data or use the data that we gather much more efficiently, and the sheer number of um, points of contact, or I forget the it's way the that, is it in the presentation? Yeah. Um, treatments and injuries. So August 2018 to just January 2019, there were 62 injuries and 5,039 treatments um, at, done by our athletic trainers, um, either before practices or before games, during games, during practices. They also go to the game so that I'm sure you've seen Joe, if you've been to a volleyball game, basketball game, they're always there so that if there is an injury, both on our when we're the home team, we need to have our athletic trainer there because if the visiting team is injured, they need to also be able to respond to that student. Um, and so that's a, a standard practice as far as I understand across the MPA, but I can certainly verify if it's What happens on the days if you got hurt and your parents walked it off? Yeah, your parents brought <laughs> you to the doctors. I mean, <laughs> those, those yeah, you're really dating yourself. You had athletic trainers when I was here. <laughs> And we have, a, I mean, have at my school. we have a lot of three sport athletes who get a lot of injuries. Um, but I think to the question of is it excessive or not, we also have probably one of the highest, if not the highest participation, participation. rates, mm -hmm. not only in the state, but I would probably argue in New England. I mean, to have almost all of our students engaged in some sort of extracurricular, and it's not just sports, right? right? It's all the clubs. We have over 30 clubs at the high school. Those are all. Um, overseen directly by our athletic director, technically athletic and extracurriculars director, athletic and activities rather. Um, but we're getting better at collecting some of this data so people can really see that return on investment. Um, not to mention part of his role is also managing and facilitating and supporting our booster groups. And that's um, a big job in and of itself as well. Well, I mean, it seems clear that we need an athletic director. I'm just, it just, for me, some of those, I, I, without knowing what, you know, what anybody does, mm -hmm. it's just to, to hear with an athletic or kind of who's been a middle school, that, those are just, I guess, points of clarification for me that I'm maybe wondering. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I think one of the drawbacks of having an uh, alumni on the board is I remember what it was like when we just had an athletic director, director and a coordinator, and I'm sure the, I, uh, I know enrollment has gone up, and I know mm -hmm. participation has gone up, um, but it still ran well. And so mm -hmm. I would just, I'm not necessarily questioning the value of it, maybe just, just like the, are we being efficient mm -hmm. with our resources? Um, I don't know how we answer that question. I know, that's, yeah, so 
without talking about like I feel you have to ask me the question no, because I don't want to I don't want to say yeah. you know somebody's not position's not worthwhile but mm -hmm. without knowing that what what occurs it's hard to quantify that yeah. I'm going to put a note in our questions can we clarify role and responsibilities of athletics and activities staff and that way we can sort of have like you know well, what do you do all day And, and I, I guess I'm quantifying some of my curiosity statements again. I just want to be clear that that's not a judgment. That's more of an inquiry and, and yeah. trying to find out what, you know, just asking responsible questions. Yep. I, I appreciate it. I have one other question with athletics. I do. Sure, I have one too. Is um, with the booster funds that have turned over, and I can't think of what his title is. Um, the bookkeeper. The bookkeeper. Uh -huh. Is that part of the athletic budget as well, or is that separate? No, that is a separate account. It, this is this is the operating budget. You don't see any booster funds in this budget here. Well, I didn't know if his position was part of this. His oh. position is actually in my office. Oh, okay. He's considered uh, the group office employee because he's a banking guy with a <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the extracurricular budget, is there a line that indicates what we pay um, people who work games? That would be, Kate, do you know where that gets I'm sorry, charged? I'm people, who, um, people who manage games? Um, that's that. under the 532000, it's contracted services under athletics. Um, so game supervision um, is in the same line as referees, uh, officials and, and services. officials, yes. Is that what you're asking, April? The yes. just people who. Um, but I can't find it. That's okay. Though. It's on page so 189, bottom. Four from the I'm bottom. Different document. Oh, oh. So look for athletics and activities. Yep. Um, and look for well, there's one in the high school and there's one at the middle school. Okay. But if you're in the high school section. Thank you. And there's just a slight increase there because uh, official fees go up a l like a certain percentage each year. Those are set by the NCA for, m for the most part. Not our, our local folks who take tickets and do game supervision, but the actual official U.S. And our athletic director is in charge of assigning people to work games and take tickets and all of those yep. kind of things. So he dictates how many pe how many people are necessary and, you know, there's some sort of formula. What events you, require? Depending on the size of the event, how many people are required? For site supervision? Yeah. Um, there's a facilities formula that says, depending on the size of your group, you might need to have a custodian, you might need to have a site supervisor for outside groups. But for our own activities, I think it's just up to the you know, understanding of your department, right? No, I think there's um, there's a formula like a for it. Because depending upon like a football game versus a volleyball game, you're going to see a different amount of game supervision or not, um, and actually this is something that's in our contract that doesn't act doesn't happen regularly, but staff are also in the contract, it says that they it's would- It's one of their duties. Yeah, as a duty attender, facilitate at least yeah. one event. Um, that has not been put into practice for a number of years, and that will be a uh, sticky one if, if and when that is, is readdressed, um, probably with the contract, I'm sure we're talking about that, but, um, High school administrators attend, have to attend, depending upon if it's a basketball game, maybe one. If it's a football game, all three typically. If it's a home game, um, also as part of their oversi oversight. But I will find out um, the specific formula used for game coverage. Okay. But there is. Um, and Kate, I'm probably not going to use the right language. If there's an outside event, somebody, let's say square dancing at one of the schools, I think that's on the agenda tonight or next time, um, <laughs> there has to be uh, a staff member there as a supervisor of that event as well. And that really just helps make sure that the facilities are well cared for and that if somebody needs something or something goes wrong, there's someone who knows how the school works. 
So is that a teacher that does that or is that out of the it depends. Um, sometimes it's like it's usually someone from central office, like some of the um, support staff at central office will do those things as extra, extra pay. Okay. Um, right. But so there's a variety outside of people groups, who do it. It's usually not athletic staff so much as maybe central office staff, maybe some folks from community services can mm -hmm. act as site supervisors yeah. or um, the custodians sometimes if it's a small group. Both. They, they're yeah. there for both basically okay. because they're going to be there anyway to clean up, so they, they're there as a person to so that be helpful. So that 532000 will pay for that as well? Actually, that would come out of um, revenues from the outside group. Right. So what they if, get charged if for that. It, it would depend on where the, the person... Um, okay, yes. So on the expenditure side, I might have somebody coming out of that line who's covering for the cheering invitational. But the cheering invitational is also providing revenue right. to cover that cost. So yes. Okay. It would depend on the nature of it. If it's a custodian, they would be in facilities um, expenditures. And sometimes, like for square dancing, for example, we might waive the fees mm -hmm. for a group or um, depending on what the group is. There's different Girl Scouts, I think, is one that we might waive the fees for. Service organization yeah. kind of thing. Right. Well, I, I mean, I guess even more importantly than the rubric is, are we following the rubric? Um, for the high school event. Yeah, I would, I would, I would want to say yes. I think there's always lots of, you know, adequate supervision when I go to events, but um, I can verify that as well. And I'm assuming that it's there's some kind of pay matrix. Like, does it, is it just one stipend for, like, if you if you do this job, then you get this stipend. And is it the same for every sport? And like, so this wouldn't you know be a stipend. Thing? This would be like an hourly rate of pay, oh. right? Different than a stipend, which is like a lump sum. Oh um, yeah, I totally to assumed that if you took Texas at a basketball game, you got twenty five dollars or whatever. Right. Yeah. But that's not what it is. It's an hourly. Um, I don't know exactly. It's an hourly rate, it's an hourly rate of pay. I think. They go into but they also, there's like, there's rule, they don't stay the whole game. They're right. only there till a certain point. Um, we don't, you know, you normally need to take tickets for the first half. Right. Like but they have people like in the gym kind of hanging out, supervising and that sort of thing. Right. Right. That's, right. That's so usually, an hourly. like if I'm thinking about a basketball game, it's usually your trainers, your principal, the athletic director himself, or Jordan is usually there. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm doing anything but watching. Um, so I don't, for those types of things, after the, the people take the tickets, there's I don't know that there's anyone getting paid at that moment because they're there and there are other job functions that they're getting paid for, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But they're responsible for supervising. And Jordan and is the only one that would be hourly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So like for a director, you get there's no limit on the number of hours you serve. <laughs> Right, right. You're just there. So, so then, <laughs> there's no overtime. <laughs> most of this, I'm assuming, then is official. The yes. majority of it. Yeah, so, I mean, a good example is to go back to the unified. You can really see yeah. the difference between yeah. what a varsity official makes versus what a JV official makes, right. and that, like Kate said, that's all regulated. Okay. And we have to have X number of officials for X for each X activity. For each activity. Yep. And so, just in wrapping up athletics, unless there's more questions. I think it's pretty remarkable to take a step back and think about our athletic department, which is one of the most visible things that we do, right? So people have lots of opinions about it, plus it's a source of passion for the athletes and the parents and the community alike. We, this whole operation is run on $1.3 million. That's mind-blowing to me, and I mean in a good way. Mind-blowing in terms of efficiencies. Um, we do a lot for our kids and our community with our extracurriculars and activities, and that's not a fat budget. All right, so the next one is guidance services. I don't know if there's any specific questions about that. Guidance, contract, and services, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things, that that's another sort of um, 
unusual line this year because uh, uh, you noted that I had projected we were only going to use half of it. We actually diverted um, $5,000 to another instructional line at the high school because the guidance department had money in the bank um, mm -hmm. in their activity account that they wanted to use up, that they didn't have any reason to accumulate it. Um, they get fees from the college board for putting on testing. And so that had accumulated little by little over the, over the years until they had a, a significant amount. Um, and it's supposed to be used to pay the proctors or to pay um, for snacks for the kids or what have you for the tests, mostly to pay the proctors, but the proctors are giving the test during the school day, so they didn't have to be paid. Um, and so this year in that line, we have a $10,000 budget and then we have $5,000 that we anticipate spending because they would normally spend 10,000 and then um, they were getting the funds from another source. So why did we increase it? And that was just based on uh, what that department had proposed for their budget for next year. And I think the major increase was really in offerings of some online course opportunities for kids, which was coming out of their budget. It was actually Naviance, um, BYU, Harvard X, extension courses at 500 each, and so that would have been based on what they were projecting, the number of students they were projecting were going to use this year. And Naviance is sort of a constant, because that's, that's yeah. in that line. That's the bulk of that line every year anyway. Yeah, so, but we are, we did expand with we Naviance, added to Naviance, the alumni tracker. So right. we're trying to stay more connected with our alumni, and this will be the first year that we get to do that with our graduating seniors. So. Hello, are you guys here for the school board meeting? Come on in, we're just finishing up a finance meeting. <coughs> Come on in. Okay. Okay. So time check, 628. 628. Maybe we can just, yeah. Health services, any questions there? Um, another um, little jump in that line, in that uh, budget category is a, is a retirement stipend as well, which is sort of unusual because we never let anyone go. <laughs> <laughs> They're not allowed. <laughs> but um, if you didn't have the retirement stipend in that category, you'd actually have a 4.6% increase rather than a, what is it, 6.4? Right. Um, so again, one of those personnel heavy lines where one little element can give it a good bump. How, um how much would our elementary school class sizes or, or the num enrollment figures have to jump before we would have to have additional health services employees? Is that something that you can envision happening or? Well, the problem I think is just space wise, right? You don't really <laughs> have the space to them? put an additional yeah. health services employee. Yeah. And I don't know that there's a like a state guideline okay. for number of students to nurse ratio. I'm sure so there actually, know there's, there probably is a caseload. It's load. probably in our PD 279. Um, but it's, um, we have actually added one full-time nurse in the past five years. We started incrementally and added a half-time position. And it was, un unfortunately, that was in response to existing needs that we just, you know, were being overwhelmed by some of the, the medical needs of our kiddos. But it's a good question. I mean, it, all of those ancillary kinds of services will grow if you're in enrollment growth. Well, I'm just worried, you know, is that something that we're 800 to 1 is the state guideline, which is the minimum So that's the minimum requirement. So they say that, and this is for, uh, I should be clear here, is this pre-K, K, no, yeah. So students to staff ratio, 800 to 1 for a nurse. Boy, that would be really hard. <laughs> um, and so I think ours the is. The K2's come close. That's, that's at pre-K, K, then one to five, it's one, uh, 800 to one, six to eight, 800 to one, nine to 12, 800 to one. They must have a different school population from what we Are we 800 to one? So no. No. No, 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 we have, so that would be a total of um, 3.6, we have 6.0 FTEs total, unless I'm in the right area, so. So we're fine. We're good. Yeah. Okay. And there is, you know, there, there would be an opportunity to shift staff too. We have in the past had our school nurses um, be more itinerant. Mm -hmm. 
Um, right now we have, everybody has a home base except for the K2s, which mm -hmm. obviously they move around. Um, but you know, we have the ability to split the staff days. It's not the most efficient thing, but um, to accommodate shifts in enrollment. So if we like see declining enrollment in one building and increasing in another, we, we do have a little bit of flex there. But it's a good point, though, because when we say we need another classroom teacher, then, you know, in the long term, you're really thinking if it's a big in increase in enrollment overall, you're also thinking about all those ancillary services. Right. Here's a little fun fact um, since I'm looking at this. So for teachers, the state guideline student to staff ratio for pre-K is 15 to 1, 1 to 5, 17 to 1, 6 to 8, 17 to 1, high school, 16 to 1. That's the reimbursement model, basically. That's the, yeah, ratio. Oh, the the, the uh, funding model ratio. Can we just check, are that meeting in here or in the? It's in here. It's in here. Yeah. We're in what here for school board? board? Yes. Oh, really? Okay. I'm never really going to be it. warm ever again. <laughs> oh. I was, I like counting down the minutes until we could leave this ice box. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm just crushed. Wait, you're too hot or you're too cold? She's cold. cold. Oh, it's oh, always cold in here. Oh, just in the interest of time, should we, are there like specific things that you guys want to talk about? Because there's quite a few more categories. I've asked, I think, all of my. Yeah, I, my prioritized list of questions, we've hit every one of mine. So apart from I'm sure um, I will. just gathering some more information based on what the questions have been, which we can work on, and, and I had also said to Sarah, that we'll try to pull things together into one place because we've been answering emails and um, Sarah put some things into our old Q&A doc and we'll, we'll sort of fluff things up so that everything's in one spot. Um, apart from that, we can also continue to ask questions through this document. Um, but do we have an, an, um, an immediate thought about our workshop with the town council on Um, that's kind of premature and we haven't even gotten to any um, ask either I mean well yeah there's additions. a whole there's yeah, a whole pile well. about the investments and how mm -hmm. do we feel about how they're prioritized mm -hmm. so far and what else is out there right and do you think we need to have another meeting before that workshop um, so we can hopefully but we'll have answers to the questions that we have right. and then we can formulate whatever our presentation is we don't even know what our agenda is for that meeting which um, I've asked for from Sean, but I haven't asked for formally. So I'll, I'll take an action email to Tom and, and Sean. And this is for May 6th is meant to be full board, full yep. school board, full town council, which is a great opportunity for everybody to be at the table together. I think what we should be prepared to have for that meeting is this document with what are the items in motion that we now, the yellow boxes that we can now answer. Um, and then what are some of the capital adjustments that we can, that we agree with. We can um, one yeah. of the things that, yeah. We can discuss it more and we, I mean, we do have a, a few more minutes if you guys wanna have the conversation now. I think it's safe to say, and I'll look for you guys to correct me, that there really aren't any adjustments that we wanna make, that the board would recommend making to the investments. To the new investments. To the new investments. Now you mean? Correct. Before, before the workshop. Yeah. No. So this, the red line kind of stays where it is. And if anything, Julie, it sounds like your projections for K two would would only go up and not down. Current, depending on where we are. Um. Wait, I may, I may not have understood you correctly. Can you repeat that? So, right now, if we look at the investments where the red line is, oh. would you make any changes to that? So oh. would you move the red line up or down or take any or take anything out of the current investments? Well, I guess I don't remember, but I did want to discuss the inclusion specialists after hearing about the number of children coming in with special needs and, mm -hmm. and what that means. I was a little bit worried about that and, and wanted to have a discussion about, about that. So, and, and what is, and, and I guess I don't know enough about that position specifically. I mean, is that something that actually might have a return on investment as well as being sort of the right thing to do? 
Um, like meaning you may have not left room for an ed tech or something in the future if you can. Yeah, so we can share with you the proposal as it was written by Allison and ask her to come to the next meeting to actually answer really specific questions. In terms of return on investment, I think what you would, the kinds of things we would be measuring are, um, you know, behavioral interventions in the, in the um, you know, are students able to be in the classroom more? Are students able to receive, receive services more? Are stu students able to be mainstreamed more? So quantifying it in sort of minutes is a way to get that return on it, uh, kind of measure that, the value of that position. But it also would be teacher feedback because there would be a lot of educating the staff around what, what inclusive practice, practices look like, what is universal design um, for all students. And so it's really about shifting mindset as well. And the goal would be that you would have less students. Um, one of the goals may be that there are fewer students needing really um, uh, um, out of classroom placements because they would be able to get their needs met within the mainstream classroom, which is always our goal. We're trying to mainstream as much as we can. So I'd be really interested in that, like especially knowing the, the sort of growing population. Okay. So do we are we going to schedule another meeting? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so I'll definitely ask Al Allison to come to that Thank meeting you. and address us from her about her vision for that role. Really quickly, while we're still on the new investments page, has there been any more discussion of um, sharing the human resource specialist with the town? So we haven't had any formal discussions with the town, but Kate and I were talking about this today, and Leanne and I had a conversation about it as well. Um, that sounds like a really easy fix to say, like, great, we'll share Liam, and he'll serve both the town and the school. Um, but I don't believe that that would help us realize the value that this position would have. We would still need another person because he's not going to be able to absorb 500 plus more employees and actually support them in the way that they would need to be supported. So would it require a different level? We have a pretty low level position um, in the budget. It's not at a director rate. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's a specialist and not a director. So, um, we, so I guess the answer is no. We haven't had any formal conversations about that. Well, the other thing I was wondering is do the, does the town and the school use the same software and all of that sort of type mm -hmm. of stuff? I mean, we use the same financial software and payroll software, yes. Um, I think the, the difficulty that we run up against is that the way public schools are, um, the word isn't managed, the, the the legal structure of employment in a school system is different from the legal structure of employment under a town charter. Um, so there, there are some definite um, areas of expertise that would be different for a school employee and a town employee. Interestingly, Liam used to work for the town of Westbrook and did both, town and school. Um, I don't think he liked it very much because it was an, a very overwhelming and complex job. It was two jobs. Um, but he would certainly have a, a good lens on what that would take. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's not something that we've gone any further having conversations about, but it's obviously a question that's out there. I mean, it sounds good, but I don't know. Right. Maybe is it I practical? Just, I was curious. Right. Right. Is it is practical? The conversation had advanced since the last time yeah. we were together. And I think I would agree with Julie that regardless of whether we were able to leverage that relationship uh, in, in any kind of a, a way to create efficiencies, you would still need another human being. So you guys, people are coming in. I do want to give an opportunity for public comment before we close too, um, but are there any final burning questions? No, I can make public comment. Awesome. So I think before we leave tonight, let's try and, did you bring your work calendar? Awesome. We'll try and get another um, meeting on the calendar before the May 6th workshop. Um, public comment? No, no public comment. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I'm looking behind you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Close. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Ordinance, I think.